we gather, we recognize that we're on Treaty 3 lands, which are steeped in rich Indigenous history and home to many First Nations and Métis people today. We continue to be thankful for the partnerships with Indigenous people. We give thanks for the many blessings we enjoy in the city of Kenora. We seek wisdom in our minds, clearness in our thinking, truth in our speaking, and always love in our hearts, so that we may try always to unite the citizens of Kenora. Let these principles guide us in our decision making. Uh, thank you, Councillor. Uh, moving on the agenda, uh, declaration of pecuniary interest and the general nature thereof. Uh, item number one on uh, today's agenda, or item number two from the meeting at which a member was not in attendance, uh, seeing none. Uh, item number C, confirmation of previous committee uh, minutes. Uh, so there's a motion. Um, it'll be motion number one. Uh, resolution number one, moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Bonner, and the minutes of the last regular committee, the whole meeting held October 3rd. 2022 and the special committee that will be held the 25th, November 17th, 22nd, 24th, two sessions, 29th and 30th, keeping firm as written. And I'll move to approve the minutes of the last regular meeting of the whole meeting held October 3rd, 2022, and the special committee that will be held the 25th, November 17th, 24th, two sessions, 29th and 30th, keeping firm as written. Thank you. Uh, any discussion? No. Uh, call, uh, call the vote. All in favor? <laughs> okay. Opposed? None. Carried. Thank you. Uh, moving on the agenda, we have a we have a, a very a very packed agenda today, and that so uh, item number D deputations. We actually have five of them, uh, and I see Joe Barnes is here. Hi, Joe. Hi, Joe. Good. Um, so uh, you're first up on the uh, on the agenda. Is that is that okay? That's okay. 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 You ready for me? We are ready. Thank you. Thanks, folks, uh, for inviting us. And, uh, see a lot of new faces and some old faces, but new faces too. Uh, nice uh, congratulations to everybody on your elections. And I look forward to working with you. Yeah. Well, Hi, name is Joe. Do you, want, do you want to use the podium? Sure. Uh, my name is Joe Barnes. I'm the executive director of the Dark Chips. Uh, I've been that for the last 12 years. And uh, we're uh, pretty aggressive little organization. We employ uh, approximately 200 um, people at KCA, and uh, we also own Wigwas, and we employ another 170 there. Um, our major projects is our youth camp, the youth wellness camp. Um, this is a camp that's open to everybody. Uh, we've been owners of it for a little over a year now, a year November. And uh, it's a place where we want to bring youth from our communities as well as uh, um, Kenora and, and area, that we can build peer relations for, for kids and youth and uh, rebuild families. It, uh, we get three to 400 kids out there a month now and uh, they're coming from the schools, they're going horseback riding, they're going sleighing, they're going dog sled sleighing. Uh, we're building an outdoor arena there uh, funded by the National Hockey League Two baseball diamonds are going out there, funded by the Toronto Blue Jays. Yeah, we're doing a lot of things. We have uh, that uh, uh, folks that's been out there. If you remember the old um, ranch type building, that's now a fully functional restaurant. And um, so we're having events out there where people come out. And the OPP was out there recently with uh, Treaty Three Police, and they did some training at the facility and enjoyed a beautiful lunch that was prepared for them. So yeah, it's a uh, it's a community uh, um, camp. It's not just for First Nations, it's for everybody. Our chiefs want to include everybody in this. Hopefully rebuild some relations in the area. Second biggest one, uh, I guess, would be, I should put this one first maybe, but the hospital. Uh, we're partners in the new hospital built. Um, you know, it, uh, it's a big project. It's a big undertaking. There's going to be a lot of resources locally you know fundraising that has to be done but uh, we're going to bring in the federal government and try to augment some of those uh, resources that are required locally uh, and uh, get the federal government to put some money into the project so we're working on that as you know the the first phase of that project is finished we're going into the second phase and we're meeting the owners early january but owners possible property that we're looking at purchasing in uh, January. 
Um, the next one is a 160 bed long-term care facility. We've been awarded uh, 64 new licenses. We own, like I said, Birchwood. We turned it into non-profit. Um, we're just seeking the charitable license for that. And um, one of the things that, one of the issues that we have with that facility is that we don't get a levy like the other home in town. So there's no levy provided. So um, right now we're running deficits in the care. But when we took that place over, and, and if you think about it, that was a horrible place. I, I gotta tell you, it was a horrible place. Not a lot of people wanted to go there. We have a waiting list now, uh, first time ever. And uh, so the change uh, management that we put in there and the services that we're providing, it's a welcoming place to come to now. Uh, the new 160 bed facility, we're looking at putting it at Rack Portage, you know, where the peninsula was, where that uh, lodge burnt down. That's where the new 160 bed uh, will be built. It's for everybody. It's not just for First Nations, but it's for everybody. And uh, we're, we don't know what we're going to do with the building there. Um, I think we really need supportive housing in town. So, uh, so we might turn that into a supportive housing. We'll work with KDSB on that one. Uh, what else are we looking at? Yeah. Uh, we have uh, the Community Justice Center downtown. We took the old mining news building and uh, we're working with the Ministry of Attorney General. Uh, you guys are welcome to go down and see that building, but if you go inside, it's, an, it's amazing. It's like state-of-the-art uh, building. In it. And uh, that where, is where the Community Justice Center will be in Kenora. Uh, the other one is the uh, Youth Wellness Hub downtown. Uh, that's ours as well. Uh, <laughs> we started that, and we have approximately was it 160 youth that access that center a month that are living on the street or, or needing services. That's about it for now. <laughs> but you know what, uh, one of the things, and, and I always, I brought this forth last time I was here, but you know, we have issues downtown, we know that, you know. Uh, I come from Muskoka, I grew up in Muskoka. I watched Muskoka build, my, my uh, uncle was mayor. and. Uh, we ended up starting taxing the people around the lake. And we made an agreement with them that, you know, they had, um, they had voting rights within the municipalities. And uh, so they, they started paying uh, taxes like everybody else. And I think we have to take a look at that here. Because, you know, we have a lot of social housing issues. Um, downtown core putting some investment into to, uh, storefronts, uh, which, you know, Muskoka did. We can really make Kenora attractive for people that want to be downtown. I want my grandchildren to be able to walk down with their moms uh, downtown and not worry about it. So anything that we can do to help out, uh, we're there. But I think um, we, we really need to look at taxing the unincorporated territory here and bringing those resources to build social housing and infrastructure downtown. So that's all I can say. Any questions for me? Council, any questions? Oh, no. Thank you, Your Worship. <laughs> Hi, Joe. Good morning. Um, are you able to share for the Justice Center, um, is there a date that's that has been established when it will be operational? Oh, I believe it's mid-December. Uh, okay, that's exciting. Yeah, yeah. We have to wait till the minister comes, you know, and cuts the ribbon. But uh, it's all finished. Uh, it, it, uh, it's ready to go. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councilor Walker. Yeah, this is more of a comment than a question. Okay. I had the pleasure of touring the youth wellness hub at their open house on the weekend, and you got a dynamic group there, and they seem to be doing you know, a great job in the community. Thank you. Councillor yeah. Manson. Could you explain to me, because I'm new. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the community justice center, exactly what will that be doing? We just built the building. <laughs> we'll provide some of the services. Um, the Community Justice Centre, there's three of them in uh, Ontario. We were the third uh, selected site in Ontario. Um, and we had arm wrestle for that. Uh, Sue Lookout wanted it and uh, we brought it to Kenora. But this is where you're looking at, you know, first time offenders where they're coming into the justice system. They end up with criminal records. And that sticks with them for, for, what, 10 years, I think it is? 
uh, before the new department. So we're looking at wrap around services for these individuals instead of putting them into the actual justice system and, and creating that uh, criminal record. We're looking at how can we do some community based healing for folks and their families. So that's it, it's a great opportunity to uh, help kids get out of that system and youth. Uh, hey Joe, I just wanted to ask about the youth wellness camp. Um, what's the referral process? Is there a mechanism in place that's a clear referral process for agencies to refer to have access to it? Yeah, sure. From my vantage point, I, 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 it seems to be a bit arbitrary. Yeah. Not that it's not being used, but I know that in other projects that I've been involved in, uh, the success really hinges on a clear process yeah. where it can be tracked. Um, it, um, agencies have a, a clear understanding of how they can access services, so maybe you just yeah. It, uh, right now, like we've only been a year and a half, yeah. so uh, we have Serena Can Kennedy out there right now, and that's who you contact if you want to go out for any type of programming. Um, the uh, horse therapy program, which is Tony, Tony. Um, and, and that's all on their website. So it's by the, the website. Then? Yeah, by the website. Yeah, you just make a call up. <laughs> Right now, we're not doing a, we're doing land-based healing for our clients. We, we have a huge mental health team and we have a lot of clients. There's, no, there's no forms or official no. documents or anything no. that has to be no. so good. No. And how you, how, how you um, kind of successfully have tracking that, you said three to 400 youth? Three to 400 youth, is, and they're coming from and the that's schools. Just calls or that's just no, like they're coming from bodies. the schools. Okay. Yeah. yeah, the schools are bringing them in. Okay. So they're not, necessarily youth that are um, suffering from mental illnesses or, or, or addictions or anything. It's just kids going to school, coming up and enjoying the camp. The reason I ask is because you and I both yeah. know the importance of data yeah. and, and a process, of uh, established process, so there's no, you know, it's, uh, there's no misunderstanding about how to access it. Uh, how, how to access it. Yeah. We're, we're hoping that a lot of the community partners will start getting involved. Um, Unfortunately, when you make change and when you make, you know, people get a little jealous that uh, you're growing so fast and then the <laughs> it becomes almost like a competition, unfortunately. Uh, but you need to create those partnerships and relationships. Like it's, we want more other agencies coming up and utilizing the, the property. Thanks, yeah. Any other questions? Um, well, uh, thank you, Joe. Um, no problem. I, I mean, I had the pleasure of uh, visiting the Strecker property. In, in, uh, was that maybe eight, nine months ago we were out there? Yeah. yeah, yeah. There both. And I know more activity has occurred. Um, so um, I think it would be beneficial for all of council maybe when the weather gets a little bit warmer, yeah. uh, maybe in the spring or you know, May or something, uh, to uh, uh, to visit again and then see uh, where you're at there. But I think it's a very important project. And I, I know there's been a lot of support around uh, like administration and the, and the council table here for uh, where you're at now. And I think, uh, I hope that will continue uh, as, as the future rolls on, so. I'd like to see, you know, more of the social services moving out of downtown and more into the, a place like the camp. And I couldn't agree more. So, uh, so anyways, thank you very much thank and you uh, keep up the good work. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Welcome, Kika. Thank you. And Joe, it's really nice to hear that update because that's my family farm, like uh, one of the Strucker grandchildren. So it's really, uh, and my son is headed out there to do the equine therapy program, is that what we So really delightful to know that it's in such good hands and getting such good use. Uh, good morning, everyone. Mayor Poirier, council, uh, city managers, members of the gallery, press. It's really lovely to be back in this room again. I haven't been here since before the pandemic. Um, and it's really nice to be with all of you. Um, welcome back and congratulations to those who are new to the room. Um, for those who don't know me, my name is TK Newton. Uh, I was born and raised in Kenora. I, gr I grew up here. I live with my husband, Mike, uh, and our kids, Maya and Sam, who are there in that photo uh, at our off-grid property just east of town. 
we live with uh, on a, the same property where I grew up. Um, it's my mom and dad's place. We live next door to my sister and my niece. Our family has really deep values around care for land and, and stewardship of land, uh, water, people, and place. Uh, we care a lot about living things. I'm here today to talk to you about the area in which I work, which is climate change and sustainability. I'd like to give you some ideas to consider for your term ahead as leaders of our community. Anecdotally, I think we all notice when the weather is peculiar um, or when environmental conditions feel off. Variable weather and environmental conditions have always existed, that's true, but what feels different today, I think, is not just the strangeness of rain or cross-country skiing in a tank top in January, or heat above 40 degrees in summer like we had in 2021, or immense floods or forest fires, but the frequency with which these things happen um, and have been happening in recent years, and the extreme variability from one season or year to the next. In order to assess whether we're right or wrong in feeling that the climate conditions are different now than when they were when I was a kid, um, we can look at the long-term environmental monitoring data set from our neighbors just to the east at the Experimental Lakes area. <clears throat> the Experimental Lakes area is a world-renowned freshwater research facility and today it's operated by the International Institute for Sustainable Development. I borrowed a couple of slides from uh, my friend Scott Higgins, who's a prof uh, at Lakehead and a researcher at ELA, um, and this one I thought was particularly noteworthy. For the last 10,000 years or so, geophysical data show that the annual average temperature in our region has been remarkably consistent from year to year. That only started to change in about 1850. Since 1969, ELA itself has measured and kept rather, uh, records of weather, climate, and atmospheric chemistry data in its study lakes and reference lakes, and at a land-based weather station near the base camp site. Their record shows that in recent decades, year-to-year -year variability has been huge relative to the past 10,000 years. For the first 10 years of their data set from 1970 to 1980, you see variability in the temperatures, um, but it's mostly uh, to the cooler side. When you hit the <coughs> 1980s though, the variability, incre it, it's, it's still really variable, but there is a trend toward increased warming that doesn't slow down. And <coughs> since 2000, there have been more years that have been above average temperature than have been cooler. ELA scientists have also looked at monthly data. So this is average annual temperature data in this slide, but it, they've also looked at monthly climate data and they've found that the most dramatic climate changes in our area actually have happened in the shoulder season. So not in winter or summer, but spring and fall. Spring tends to start earlier and fall runs later. Our winters are an average about a day, uh, a day shorter per year over the last 40 years. So that adds up to being almost a full month more ice-free since the 1970s. This has major effects on plant growth. Uh, when you have more ice-free days, you have more time for plants to grow, and that impacts the entire food web, including fish. When there's no ice, plants, including algae, can grow. And so the algae season in 2022 is now far longer than it was 40 or 50 years ago. There's always been algae in the lake. It just lasts a lot longer now than it used to. ELA scientists have also found that as a result of regional lakes warming over recent decades, cold water fish like lake trout are showing a trend toward lower body size and smaller population sizes as a result of having less habitable area in the lakes as they warm. ELA scientists have projected that lake trout will likely be eradicated in and around Kenora in the next 15 years because of climate warming. These data from ELA align with evidence worldwide. Our local trends are consistent with global climate change trends. Globally, scienti climate scientists have documented that the Earth's global surface temperature has increased by about 1.1 degrees Celsius compared with the average from 1850 to 1900. Our current global surface temperature is higher than at any point in the last 125,000 years. 1.1 degrees Celsius is the worldwide average, um, but in northern regions, temperatures have risen faster, and around Kenora, our average temperature has already increased by 2 to 3 degrees Celsius. So this is a slide from the Climate Atlas at the Prairie Climate Institute in, uh, in Winnipeg. And you can toggle through this website. I included the link in the speaking notes if you're interested. And you can see all the different projections for all the different temperature and uh, weather conditions over the next, over this century. Um, 
1850, I mentioned a few minutes ago, I'll go back to it, is when this curve starts to rise. Um, it's a noteworthy date because it marks the beginning of the Industrial Revolution when Western society uh, first started burning coal as part of the move from using human and animal labor to, uh, as the primary source of energy that fueled the economy to using oil uh, and other fossil fuels. By the early 20th century, oil and natural gas had joined coal as cheap, plentiful, very concentrated sources of energy. And fossil fuels have, of course, since become the foundation of our modern global economy. Although fossil fuels bring us lots of undeniable benefits, they come with some very serious side effects. Not only are they extremely environmentally damaging to produce, but burning them releases gaseous pollutants like methane, carbon dioxide, and nitrous oxide. Um, <clears throat> which have been accumulating in the atmosphere since 1850. These gases, so carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, and a few others uh, that are refrigerants, the hydrofluorocarbons, um, <clears throat> act like they, they're called greenhouse gases because they act like glass on a greenhouse trapping solar radiation in the atmosphere. Over time, these chemicals have accumulated in the atmosphere, and it takes millennia for them to get recycled back into the Earth's terrestrial and ocean systems. And so the greenhouse effect they're causing is leading to measurable warming of the Earth's atmosphere and oceans. While the temperature data show an overall warming trend over recent decades, I'm sure all of you are no doubt <laughs> thinking about how cold it is outside right now and how miserable it was last winter, and that doesn't seem to square with global warming. It might seem a bit counterintuitive, but actually that's not at all inconsistent with climate change expectations. In order to understand what's happening locally, we actually have to zoom out and think of climate change as a global phenomenon. It's a planetary change that has disruptive local impacts. We need to look at the bigger scale than just our region to see how global warming is destabilizing the Earth's major atmospheric and oceanic currents and climate systems. As the atmosphere and oceans warm, uh, water and air currents, such as the jet stream, which is shown here as that wavy line, uh, the jet stream is the main west to east atmospheric current over Canada. These currents become less stable and more chaotic. It's similar to how you can think about a pot of water as it heats. You can see all the swirly pattern of the currents in the water as it, as it reaches a boil. A similar thing is happening in the atmosphere and in the oceans as uh, these, these streams get disrupted. Last winter, the jet stream was weakened by warmer than usual air rising off of a warming Pacific Ocean. This meant that the usually powerful atmospheric current did a really poor job of holding the cold air up north. Instead, without a strong jet stream to keep the Arctic air in place, it washed down over us for most of the winter. And in fact, just this week, right now, we're having the same thing happen. Here's an illustration from November, uh, the November 27th weather network forecast and it shows that weakened jet stream that allows the polar vortex to descend on us. And so it's really cold here right now, while in Iqaluit, uh, or in Inuvik, which is up uh, by Fairbanks, up way up north, it's about the same temperature there right now as it is here, but that's 20 degrees above seasonal norm for them and it's 10 degrees below seasonal norm for us. <clears throat> Climate change is also to blame for the absurd amount of snow we had last year that nearly broke me trying to keep our road plowed all winter. Um, and the reason for that is a warmer atmosphere holds more water. And so anytime it rains or snows, it really comes down because there's just so much more volume of precipitation in the clouds. Another way that climate change is really hammering our region is through the disruption of our ability to, ability to regulate and manage water flows. And in my view, this is our region's biggest climate change challenge. It's the fact that we can no longer manage environmental systems because they no longer behave in consistent and predictable ways. One of the roles I play regionally involves the International Joint Commission, which is a binational institution that helps to manage waterways that are shared between Canada and the United States. One of our responsibilities is to regulate water levels on the boundary water system into Namak and Rainy Lakes, which then flow into Rainy River and on into Lake of the Woods. In the past, we've been able to manage water levels by opening or closing floodgates and the hydroelectric dams on those lakes. Water levels are managed to, uh, to optimize navigation, electricity generation, ecological and social values. And this water management system has persisted and worked really well for the past hundred years because we knew that each spring when we got snow and ice melting, that was the year's biggest influx of water into the system and we just needed to plan for it. 
In recent years, however, <clears throat> we've seen unprecedented drought that has tested managers' planning limits, and then huge random spring and summer rainfall events that have totally dwarfed the spring freshet, delivering unfathomable amounts of water into the system and totally overwhelming anyone's ability to manage it. And that's what happened in 2022. Our water regulatory systems are not and cannot be designed to manage water that comes at us so unpredictably and at such high volume when it does come <coughs> or with such infrequency in drought years. Instead, we have to adapt our systems, our communities and our individual lives to be more resilient so that we can withstand variability more than we did in the past. And so what are we going to do about all of these challenges and problems? In 2018, the city produced a community energy plan that looked at energy consumption and emission sources for the city's operations and the broader community level. Because, uh, <clears throat> because Kenora's largest economic activities in the past decade haven't been so heavily focused on industry, most of the energy use in Kenora isn't around heavy industry, but around transportation and residential and commercial buildings, heating and cooling and operations. Um, and for the city, it's especially the rec center and water and wastewater treatment. The next couple of slides illustrate the city of Kenora as main users of electricity and natural gas. Um, you can see that wastewater and, and operations at the, um, at the rec center, heating and cooling uh, of the ice surface and heating the pool use a lot of electricity and gas. And so consequently, this is what the mix of our GHG emissions as a city, like as the corporation of the city looks like. Um, a lot of it is fleet vehicles and transportation, but the, the ice surface and the pools also demand a lot in water and wastewater. At a residential level, <coughs> lots of, and, and commercially, lots of us live and work in older and drafty buildings that weren't designed with energy efficiency in mind. Energy inefficiency is expensive, so improving buildings' efficiency is an excellent long-term savings measure. Efficiency can be improved by improving insulation and stopping up leaks in a building envelope. And the more efficiently a building operates, the less energy that goes into it. If that energy is from fossil fuel sources, improving efficiency also reduces emissions. Even better, you can switch from heating buildings with gas furnaces to using electric air-to-air -air heat pumps to heat in winter and cool in summer. It's a great way to save money over the long term, and it drops your building's emissions to almost zero. Adding net zero technologies such as solar thermal heating or district heat pump systems to the city's operations of the rec center and water and wastewater treatment plants though costly up front, up front would dramatically lower the city of Kenora's emissions profile and long-term energy costs while reducing energy price volatility. Many of these improvements the city can do as showcase pieces to help spur residential homeowners, landlords, and private businesses to undertake similar improvements to their properties. <coughs> Municipal building bylaws and incentive programs can also be tools to support action. And then in addition to the community energy plan, last year the city also finalized its sustainability action plan, which <coughs> I view as a companion plan to the CEP, which is sort of a more strategic orientation. The sustainability action plan includes a lot of really good accessible background information. I encourage you to read it. Um, and it lays out 14 priority projects that could help the community to enhance its climate, environmental, social, and economic sustainability. Some of these projects are intended to be championed by citizen groups, in some cases perhaps private businesses or other public partners, and many will need some level of involvement, coordination, and financial commitment from the municipal government working alongside indigenous, federal, and provincial counterparts. The Sustainability Advisory Committee is tasked with helping council to move forward on implementation of this plan and overseeing the work that's recommended in it. And I'm really excited to see what we can accomplish together in the coming years. I'll be sitting on that, that committee for this term. Even for matters that aren't strictly within municipal jurisdiction, council can play a constructive role in helping to communicate with citizens about the benefits of taking climate action um, and the programs and opportunities available to local residents, the steps that people should consider to increase their resilience and decrease their personal and community risk. And so uh, I'll just flip through these, but you can read the report and they're all in there too. Um, <clears throat> So wrapping up, <laughs> we live in a time of massive ecological and social change. We live in fearful times. War is raging and political turmoil affects so many parts of the world. Many people are hurting, not just around the world or across Canada, but right here in our own community and likely here, uh, some of us in this room. Inflation, which is largely driven by the volatility of fossil fuel energy, is making life really costly for all of us and especially those on the lowest ends of the income spectrum. 
I think many in the community are feeling the pinch particularly keenly right now with the holidays almost upon us <laughs> because it's a pretty daunting prospect to have to choose between heat, food, transportation, and still find ways to foster seasonal cheer when you have little or no money to spare. As a council in 2022, you all face a really big task to lead with compassion, thoughtfulness, and care, not just for Kenora's present, but also our future. In a world that's getting smaller and more vulnerable and chaotic, I encourage you all to always be informed and aware citizens, not just of this town, but of your global community. Think about how you can best ensure the people of this community are made as secure as possible while still preserving a high quality of life for everyone. And think about how all our efforts here in Kenora tie into the experiences of others all around us. There are helping hands and minds in many, many places, and we have lots to offer our neighbors too. The number one thing that will see us through crisis is our connection to others. And this above all else, I believe, is your task this term. Build the genuine connections among local people that will help us to solve problems together and will help us to be in relationship with others. Because when we're in relationship with other people, we're accountable to them. And we also find in them our spark and our passion to contribute and be part of something that's useful and meaningful. So thanks for your time. <laughs> and I'm happy to answer any questions or go for coffee anytime and talk about this stuff. Uh, Cause yeah, it's, uh, it's my bread and butter. <laughs> thanks Tika. Um, just there. before I forget though, uh, is it possible for you to uh, Flip the uh, your presentation to the city. Place. Yeah, I did. I, yeah. I shared it all with Heather, oh, okay. so she's got a copy of everything. Pardon? This morning. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. I, I hadn't seen it yesterday. It yet, so so okay. you have a more in-depth written report that's got all the links to all of the okay. resources in it. Okay. Then, Sorry yeah. about that. Thank you yeah. very much. No. Uh, any questions, at council? No. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Kika. Yeah. Okay, uh, moving on the agenda, uh, next is uh, Susan uh, Evident, uh, and that's Anishinaabe Park contract extension. Is that the one you would like to start with? Or? Yes, that would be perfect. Okay, and then you just want to continue on with your, your next on the agenda also. Perfect, okay, thank you. Okay. Um, I'm one of the operators of Anishinaabe Park. I work in partnership with Middle Lake Enterprises, and that is David Lange. David Launch would be here, but he and his son Ryan are currently motorcycling through Nepal, so um, that he's not. <laughs> um, according to our contract, uh, it's a five-year contract with an optional two-year extension. Uh, it is um, Section 2A of the Terms of Agreement between the City of Kenora and Middle Lake Enterprises. So we would like to exercise that two-year extension. Ideally, if we could exercise a 10-year extension, we'd be happy to do that. We have long-term goals at Anishinaabe Park, and um, we're accomplishing them. So I'll just go through some of the things we've done in the four years that we've been operating the park. The extension would be from 2023 is our final year in five years, so it would be beyond that. So um, we, we believe that as park operators, we have an obligation to our campers to give them the best possible experience. We also believe we have a responsibility to the city of Kenora, to the residents of Kenora, uh, to manage this park um, and bring in revenue for the whole town. So as a result, we have, uh, over the four years that we've been in operation, we've invested $80,000 in park improvements, $20,000 a year on average, and there's a list of them in the documents that I sent. Uh, that, and that is as reported to Revenue Canada. It does not include the labor that David Lange and Middle Lake has done that is not considered billable. Like, we don't bill it. He's just there working and he's done those projects. Um, our campers positively report on their camping experience due to the changes that we've made. Some of them have we replaced the sewage uh, facility, the dumping facility, with a modern, clean, hygienic facility. Uh, we've upgraded camp campsites, we've improved electrical, electrical um, hookups in some. Um, Anishinaabe <coughs> Park receives a large number of inter international travelers and Canadians who have a li uh, limited, I'm nervous, sorry, <laughs> so I'm a bit shaky here, uh, who have limited English skills. Uh, so we encourage our staff to utilize their French skills with our campers. As a result, I have been studying French for three years and I can now engage in some conversational it's fun to watch me interacting, you know, with um, French-speaking people and how we manage to get their pidgin English and my pidgin French to work. So it's been a really um, a good experience. 
Um, we consistently manage the gate hours, and um, we also they have installed a, an, an electronic gate, an electric gate that operates on the timer. And that um, enforcement of the gate hours and the enforcement of the bylaw 272007 has resulted in a quiet setting. Um, I included in my presentation letters of reference from our campers um, on some of the improvements we've made. The quiet setting, the non-party atmosphere of Anishinaabe Park has been positively reported on. Um, it is a family campground. We've encouraged that. And both the neighbors uh, around us across the bay have reported on how nice it is that the park is quiet. Uh, for many of our campers, most of our campers, Anishinaabe Park is a vacation destination. They are coming here to spend their vacation dollars. Um, they're not, we're not a road to some place, we are some place. And we, re we recognize that, and we recognize that our local business owners depend on Anishinaabe Park. They, they depend on the tourists that we bring in and our good management of the park. If we can't get people to come, they're not going to spend their money here. And, and it's imperative that um, we take this responsibility seriously. Uh, in 2019, we implemented a consistent and fairly managed online, online reservation system and it has resulted in full occupancy of our RV sites from July through September. Our campers have noted, had told us in the previous systems, difficulty with you know, not doing things online, um, that uh, there was oftentimes it would show that they were fully, the park was fully occupied, but in practice they'd be sitting there and there were empty campsites around them. Part of that is the result of our deposit system. Uh, initially, they didn't like the deposit system, but now that they see that they can actually get a, a campsite because the campsite isn't vacant, um, that the deposit system is working. So they, they all are um, support that now. Uh, by carefully managing the um, reservation system, we've eliminated empty campsites. We are full. Uh, our occupancy rates year over year, um, and this includes our tent sites, so it's not 100% occupancy. In 2019, the year we took over, our occupancy rate was 76.4%. Um, I need to note in that year, I had called everybody who held a reservation under the previous system to, a set, to get them to put a deposit down. That resulted in 600 campsite days being freed up because people said, oh, I didn't realize I had a reservation then. No, no, I don't even have vacation then. Oh, I sold my trailer, I'm not coming. But all of those were reservations that were held within the system and with no money down, people don't even think of it. So by adding the, de the deposit system, that changed. So 2019 was 76.4, 2020 was 82.2, 2021, 88.4, 2022, 89.8. All of this during COVID years. So uh, we're really proud of what we've accomplished there. Uh, we're committed to growth. We're committed to the ongoing improvements of Anishinaabe Park. We don't view this as the city's property that you guys invest in and we reap the financial rewards. We came in at a higher bid than what the city was asking initially. We had, um, were very clear on our plans, summer and winter for the park. And we believe that we have a responsibility to put into the park. It's our business. It's, it's, it only succeeds for you if it succeeds for us, and that means we have to invest, and that's why we've done so. We're requesting the optional two years as per the contract. From a business standpoint, we have a 10-year goal in the park. It is a problem at this point uh, because the projects we would like to do, the upgrades we would like to make, the landscaping improvements, we pay for out of pocket. <coughs> If we don't have years to recoup that money, it impacts our ability to invest. So the, the next two years, we'll be very cautious, you know, if we get this extension, we'll be very cautious in what we do. Whereas if we knew that we had the park for 10 years, there's so much we can do, you know, and, and there, there is, we view that as our responsibility. We're making money from this park. We feel we need to give it back, but we can only give it back if we know that we have the opportunity for returns. Um, some of the things we've done, and in the report, it's year over year, like each year what we've done, but we have um, improved the, the, done renovations in the store. Some of them were paid for by the city of Kenora. Uh, most of them were paid for uh, by us. Completely overhauled, every year we overhaul the internet system. Every year we overhaul the security. That's just an ongoing. We purchased a uh, $10,000 goose fecal scooper, like whoever thought I'd ever even know that there was exist. 
Uh, we've repaired the bathroom doors um, repeatedly. It's an ongoing problem, but we were having the first year campers locked in the bathroom. One gentleman from Switzerland was locked in the bathroom for 30 minutes uh, because of faulty locking mechanisms. We installed the play oven. Uh, the winter croak curl rings have been really successful. Not as successful as we'd like, but there have been two years of COVID winter, so we couldn't do the things that we had hoped for. Um, we've improved the basement. We oh, completely renovated the fish cleaning house um, with a stainless steel cleaning surface. We also, uh, the fish cleaning house was draining all the fluid directly onto the ground. It was not in the sewer system. We and, uh, installed all the appropriate lines for that. And in doing so, that allowed us to increase service, uh, full service sites to th four full service sites now were added to the system. Sites that were just upgraded because the sewage lines were run. Um, we have um, upgraded, so we now have three 50 amp service sites that there were none prior. Uh, we've increased uh, an extra 30 amp full service site as well in 2021 and two more in 22. And the full list is there of what we've done. What we're working on right now is our winter lights project. I don't know if you saw that on the Facebook page. We've actually got our first um, winter lights project up which was all items that we outlined in, uh, that we bid when we bid, that we put in, um, that we would do. And we have done those things and we would like to do more. And in doing so, in order to do that, we do need the two year extension. Ideally, if council would consider uh, re-looking at the contract and making it um, a 10 year extension with the option of, um, of provision for exit, if either party's unhappy, we would be supportive of that too. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, any questions or comments? <clears throat> so just a point of clarification from an administrative standpoint. Council uh, makes the decision to enter into contracts. Contract administration is firmly in city administration's yes. um, yeah. purview. So just want to be clear on that. Oh, you're OK. Mm -hmm. uh, Council Bernard. Thanks for your presentation, Susan. Thank you. Um, you mentioned that you consistently manage gate hours. Um, what, what other uh, things have you put in place to manage the, your hours, the quiet time hours? And, and that oh. being said, how many uh, have you ever had to call police for oh, yes. calls, or and do you have numbers? No, numbers sure? we don't. I can tell you roughly uh, what happens. To, I live on site all summer long. I should say that I I have a lovely lakefront home on Middle Lake but I live in my trailer at Anishinaabe Park all summer long. Um, and I am, the system that we have in place for the campers is text me, follow up with a phone call. The text won't wake me up. Um, so, and, and they're very good at it for the most part. Um, so I have gone out um, either myself, David's had, it, his trailer's on the other side of the park. He's there on the weekends. I'm there 24 seven, well not 24 seven, I work during the day. Um, and so, yes, we do get, we have had to call the police. The gate is um, now much better because there's a keypad. They just enter the keypad, the gate opens, and they can come in. I can override it if I had to for any reason. So I've called on average, I'd say the first year, probably maybe four calls to police. You know, uh, last year was two. So it's generally speaking, you know, you, I'm a mom. Right, I'm a granny. I show up and I say, "Okay, guys, it's time to you know, shut this down." And I don't disappear. I've said, had some lovely nights where I'm sitting at a picnic table, two sites over, waiting for the children to go to bed. You know, and generally they do. Now, having said that, the reservation system, also the way we implement that, we are discouraging weekend partiers. People who want to come for the weekend party. Um, the system is tiered in such a way that longer term stays get first dibs. Families that are coming for week long vacations get the next stab at it. And we open for weekend reservations. Uh, like at, we've done those set reservations already. November 15th is longer than 10 days. Uh, November 17th is uh, greater than five nights. It should be greater than four nights. And then on February 1st, it opens for all. So that allows families the opportunity to know when their vacation is next year and get their vacation time in. And then it opens up for everybody who's weekend. And then, you know, they fill it up. And that limits the number of people who are just, you know, crashing for the long weekends and here to party, you know. So, so the nature of those calls would be just, what, people, intoxicated people or? Um, 
La last year, uh, drug use late at night, um, problematic behavior. Uh, the officer was wonderful, and, you know, very helpful. Uh, the second one last year. Um, that's fine. That's yeah, fine. yeah. So it was only two calls. That's what. Right. Yeah, yeah. That's no. It's it. it the, the campers are really good, you know, and I, but I think partly is it has become a family place, you know. It's, uh, I will go visit somebody, if I see a group that I think is going to be a problem, I'll just go have a chat with them, you know. I have, if I've seen in the reservation system, oh, I can tell this is a party group coming, you know, I might remind them to review, you know, the, our noise policy in the city's bylaw, you know. I, that 272007, it's in our park information. <laughs> so, yeah. Thank you. Any other questions at council? Okay. Uh, thank you, Susan. Uh, so, do you want to continue on with your next item? Okay. Which is the old Chalet Lane closure. Okay. And um, I realize that this is a more contentious issue. Um, so, when we bid, before we bid on the park operation, we found the uh, Beaches, Parks and Trails Development Project City of Kenora 2016 report. And, and that was instrumental in A, in our bidding, and B, how we bid, and our plans. And in that, um, specifically, um, they recommend the closure of Old Chalet Lane. And uh, so the, they also re recommended the gate hours and winter camping and um, many other four season activities at the park. So um, with that in mind, um, we, we believe we provide a location for the residents of Kenora and tourists who are not fortunate enough to live on lakefront property and allows them to enjoy their outdoor experience. Presence of motor vehicles and motor traffic through the park interferes with the safe enjoyment of the grounds to pedestrians and winter sports enthusiasts. Um, and regardless of signage, we have found that vehicles um, exceed the posted speed limit. In our original bid to operate National Park, Anishinaabe Park, we addressed our plan to pursue the park as a winter venue for winter camping and also to provide the safe usage for residents of Kenora. We are ready to proceed, we have, are ready to proceed with this, um, for, this uh, for this year as noted in the addendum, but we can't really move forward on those projects if we're not able to provide a winter venue that reflects the unique experience separate from urban traffic. You can't have a winter camping venue with cars driving right past the trailers. It, it just doesn't have that wilderness experience. Um, before, uh, be, before the COVID shutdowns, We'd applied for a liquor license. Um, our plans had been to have a, a food venue at the park store that would offer hot chocolate, light food, hot dogs, hamburgers, and uh, beer for limited hours. Uh, for the snow machine traffic for sun uh, Sunset Country Trail riders uh, that travel through the east side of the park, and also for walkers and people who might snowshoe, ski, um, those items within the park. COVID lockdown changed any thoughts of it being a successful business venture. There was clearly no money to be made in a bar <laughs> during COVID. Um, uh, and, and it wasn't, the, the bar operations was going to be like uh, Friday, Saturday, four to eight type thing, you know, um, very limited because obviously until we've got a core audience, we can't invest, you know, staffing dollars in that. Uh, also listed in our original bid was the creation, I'm calling it Winter Lights, it's really an unimaginative name. Um, it, it's done in many other communities. I think they call it Candy Cane Lane in Winnipeg. I first saw it in the campgrounds in Saskatoon. And basically, there's, part, there's power at all these sites and you can set up a Christmas display at these sites. And the way it worked at uh, the Saskatoon one I went to is that for Christmas week, they plow the roads and the cars drive through these wonderful Christmas displays and it costs $10 to do that and the $10 is donated to charity. Um, we wanted to take it further and have it a walking trail so that people go out in the evening, there's these lovely displays of lights and so the whole winter season, hence the winter lights idea, and then we would do the same, plow it at the week, Christmas week and allow for traffic to go through. Uh, that all has been put on hold largely because Previous to this, and largely because it's a contentious issue, um, previous council has done it year over year. We'll close it for this year, but not next, right? We'll have to do it each year. I can't go to a business and say, will you invest money in this project uh, if I can't guarantee that their advertising dollars are well spent? If it's one year, uh, they're not going to, you know, I'm not going to get the support. 
We decided regardless that we would go ahead with our first display uh, this year and because it had, it's cold, it's got to be done now, right? So we, so we put our first lights display up. Um, it's a personal passion of mine. I am a cyclist and it's Wounded Warriors of Canada. It's for veterans, first responders um, with, and their families who suffer with PTSD. And that's the charity of choice. It's two cyclists riding through the park. It's very cool. Um, small, it's not glamorous yet. Nobody's going to you know, be quoting us in some tourist magazine. But, but we have started and we want to continue starting, we'll continue with that. But we, we need the assurance that I can go to advertisers and say, would you put this display together? Yes, you can do this every year and we can build on it. I mean, right now ours is just two bikes with lights on them. But these displays have you know, wheels moving, Santa's elves flying through the air. I mean, wonderful things that other communities have done. And we would like to see that here too. We have um, purchased four trailers. Two of them are small boulder type trailers. They're small enough for winter camping. Um, two are not operational yet. Two are on site and could be um, utilized for winter camping. And we do have a plan for how we would handle bathrooms in a place that has no water in the winter. Obviously, this is not tourism that you're going to take Granny to. This is the adventure, to, adventure tourist who's going to want to do this. Maybe go ice fishing, come back, and um, enjoy you know, a little bit of warmth in a tiny little trailer. Those are ready to go, but again, we can't advertise that if we, you know, if we are always dealing with uh, whether Old Chalet Lane is going to be opened or closed. There is, in my opinion, little functional use to Old Chalet being opened other than it provides a few homes quicker access to the businesses on Mickinell Way and Highway 17, and that difference is approximately 300 meters. Um, at, the time, at the time that we first started this process, we verified with emergency services that they wouldn't opt for Old Chalet Lane as an approach for emergency access to residents um, because the status is inconsistent throughout the year. We also recognize that there are many, many one -way or dead end roads throughout this town. So making it a, a, one, a dead end road is not unique. It doesn't provide those residents with any more risk than anyone else living on a dead end road. Um, so we have tried, we were instructed from the beginning to um, work with the residents as much as possible on this. And we believe we have. Um, uh, we have the, the barricade at Old Chalet Lane in the park during the summer. We have um, adjusted the opening of it to permit a golf cart through so the son of one of the residents can safely access the golf course through the park. We've had lots of little conversations with him. He's learning to be a more responsible driver and he was really good this past year. Um, but that motor vehicle, we've adjusted that to allow for that. It's also large enough to allow quads to go through and we do speak with quad people who are driving through all through the year, advising them of safe traveling. Um, we made a, have just recently made an agreement with another neighbor who's plowing the, walk, the path through there so pedestrians can walk there and in exchange he carries on and goes to Tim Hortons, has coffee with his friends um, and so we believe that, that that was working to meet his needs. Uh, we had a conversation with another neighbor. One of the properties is adjacent to the park and has an unofficial driveway that comes into campsite 59, specifically through right, well, right beside the campsite. Um, and we have, uh, we were, he came and approached us, and so we landscaped it such that he would be able to drive construction vehicles, as was his request through, on an as-needed basis. Now, the reason we had to modify site 59 is when the park was designed. Um, the campers didn't have slide outs. Now there are slide outs and if you're camping in site 59 the way it was up until this October and you had a campfire and camp 60 had a slide out, the fire is right here by the edge of the, ca the slide out. This made the people who are in 60 and have their $100,000 camper sitting there very at risk of fire and the person in for site 59 feeling like they couldn't have a fire. So we just landscaped it by shifting it over a little bit into this driveway that is an unofficial driveway so that they have a little bit more room. Then we, when we were approached by Mr. Barkley about how that impacted him, we let, had our the heavy equipment operator adjust the, um, the surface so that he would still be able to get the construction vehicles in and out. We've had the support of both council 
um, and the Knorr staff um, on this project, bylaw 167-2021, um, has been in place, you know, for the closure. Um, so, so, so we've had the support of city and um, council. Anishinaabe Park is a green space for public enjoyment. It is our position that there are many opportunities for increased physical and mental health benefits by the use of outdoor spaces. I am fortunately living proof that there is that, that there is no safe way you can have pedestrians in the same place as motor vehicles. Sorry, this gets a little emotional. Um, it, I, I've been adjusting my hearing aids for this entire meeting. I had perfectly good hearing until I was struck by a quad in the park that shouldn't have been there. I, you know, I suffer with vertigo even though I'm a bike rider. I have long-term problems as a result of this. There is no way you can have pedestrians safely interacting with motor vehicle traffic. It just, you know, it, it doesn't exist. Uh, and we believe that Anishinaabe Park is for everybody. It is not just for people who can afford to stay there. It is a resource for the people in town who don't live on Lake of the Woods, who don't live on Middle Lake. It allows them to experience the outdoors in a safe way. And when you add vehicle traffic to that, you take away that safety. Um, we believe that it should be a legacy for generations to come. It should be a safe family place. Um, while we've through all of this, uh, the COVID years and whatnot, we had the things that we have done is, I think we, we've increased walkers to the park, we've increased family usage, uh, we've had uh, have sliding, you can purchase a, a sliding picnic basket and go sliding and there's a fireplace cleared for you. Uh, we're working on the winter camping. But I think the thing that I find most, that my biggest accomplishment, and it's the only by, by default that it's mine, is that through all of COVID, the Scouts and the Beavers met every week at Anishinaabe Park. They played in the forests, they did their activities, and, and they continued, and they could do it safely. You know, there was no concern about, oh, but their traffic light doesn't actually reach that spot, and so that child is at risk. They weren't ever at risk. And um, it's our hope that the, the people of Kenora can continue to enjoy what those of us who are fortunate to have lakefront property get to enjoy all the time. And, oh, I'm done, sorry. Oh, okay, <laughs> thanks, Susan. Um, For any someone who can speak a lot, any I questions of council? Okay, well, thank you very much. Thank you. We will take that information back with us, so thanks. Uh, moving up on the agenda, uh, Dean Barkley, uh, same same item, Old Chalet Lane Closure. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, just to introduce myself, I'm Dean Barkley, and I live at 505 Old Chalet Lane, so I'm probably most impacted by the opening and closure of the uh, park road, like uh, of Chalet Lane into Anishinaabe Park. And, um, and my property, I'll just give you a, just a brief uh, history of our property. Uh, we purchased it in 2020 from uh, the Hooks, Jim Hook and his wife Marge. We took possession in the summer. Uh, the Hooks built that house in 1974. And prior to the Hooks, the Stone family lived there or had a cottage there. And we had a side driveway, or we still do, a side driveway into Anishinaabe Park. And that's been used since uh, prior to 1974. So it's been used for a long time, over 50 years. And. Uh, uh, we would like that side driveway uh, to maintain, we'd like to maintain it still because um, we feel it's necessary for emergency services because our driveway is very steep down to our house and I don't believe that a fire truck or an ambulance would be able to get in and out of our driveway. So, so uh, prior to us purchasing the house, the city maintained the Old Shelley Lane into the park and they also uh, maintained a road to our side driveway. So we would like that back open. Uh, so we're proposing to have that open all winter and to plow to our side driveway like they had for the previous 50 years. Um, so during the 50 years that the Hooks uh, lived there, it was proposed once by the city that they close that side driveway. Uh, it was believed at the time that uh, they could get a court order 
to uh, maintain it as an easement of necessity. Uh, it didn't come to that. Uh, then uh, City Manager Rick Perchuk proposed uh, with the homeowners possibly building a road from the west side or the east side of our house up to Old Chalet Lane, and uh, that was kind of abandoned when they agreed to keep the road open. So. Uh, that side driveway, uh, recently the park management decided to uh, expand into it. Uh, they, they blocked the entire roadway with a, uh, a new campsite, or not a new, uh, just a new driveway, and with a sign in the middle of it. So I did speak to park management, they moved the sign, and they did make it a little more uh, of a gradual uh, incline up there, so I could get an emergency vehicle in and out in the summertime, but uh, without that park open, uh, I won't be able to have uh, any kind of emergency services to our house. And just to discuss the whole opening of the park uh, five, of Sh Chalet Lane, uh, I walk through there every day and I don't see any activity in the winter time at all. And uh, it's not properly maintained for the amount of walkers that go through there, because a lot of people walk by our house into the park. And I don't think it's properly maintained just by one resident who does it on his own, but he can't be relied on to do it. And with um, I mean, I didn't have to call the ambulance last year or the year before, but I do have elderly parents, and my wife has elderly parents, and we would like the option of having emergency services into our driveway. And, uh, yeah, like there might be some activity in the wintertime in the park, but I haven't seen it, and I do walk through there every day. There might, there's a little, I've seen a little tiny bit. I've seen people sitting around inside the clubhouse, but as far as actual activities, very, very little. So I don't think it... Uh, is proportionate to keeping the road closed all, all winter. So. And yeah, I think that's all I would say about it. So my proposal is to keep the road open and to maintain into the park to our side driveway. Okay, okay. thanks, Dean. Uh, any questions? Uh, Councilor Monfrey? Yes, hi, Dean. Hi. Uh, so if I look, I'm looking at the overhead map now, mm -hmm. and you're saying that the driveway into the park is to the east of your home. Well, the, yeah, there is, no, like we have a driveway from Old Shelley Lane, Lane, yeah, down to our house, but it's a very steep driveway. Yes. And I maintain it, I sand it, I plow it, but if it's just snowed or whatever, it's super, super slippery, and it'd be really difficult to even get a 4x4 four four truck up there. So what I'm saying is that if we have the need for an ambulance or fire truck, like they're not going to be able, they might be able to get down, but they definitely wouldn't be able to get up without that uh, access through the park that we've had for the last... 50, over 50 years. So the access, that's what I'm asking you. Yeah. It goes beside your house to, to, the, to the park and then off to the park. Yeah, and when I, when I purchased the house, that was always maintained by the city. And then we maintained the little side driveway, of course, into the park. But then the city maintained uh, the road up to our side driveway. And that's through, it looks, it appears to be through a wooded lot. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Thanks, it's uh, Councilor Bernie. Uh, thanks for your Words, Dean. Um, just wondering what if you're comfortable in sharing what you pay for property taxes. Uh, I don't know offhand, but I would say eight or nine thousand dollars. So. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. So we pay a fair amount of property tax. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, any other questions of council? No? Okay. Uh, thanks very much, Dean. Okay. Now do we need more information from you? Thank you. Thank you very much. <coughs> okay. Uh, Item number E, reports, uh, corporate services. So we have a couple of items. Uh, item 1-1, one one, uh, 2023 council meeting, calendar and adoption of the new procedural bylaw. Heather, are you going to speak to this? Uh, thank you, Mayor Poirier. So annually, uh, the clerk will submit the 2020 or the upcoming council meeting calendar, uh, and that is at clerk, the council's discretion and establishing the, the next year's uh, calendar for council meetings. So we've had a preliminary discussion just on the uh, council meeting dates and times, and council has proposed uh, moving to Wednesday meetings. So council would meet on Wednesdays, committee the whole at nine o'clock, uh, and the second Tuesday, and the third Tuesday, we would meet Wednesday at five o'clock for council. That is what's been proposed in the attached uh, calendar, as well as amendments to the procedural bylaw to reflect those changes. So it is now for council discussion in any direction. Uh, we'll put it up to uh, any council members. I, I know we've had a 
thorough discussion about this uh, to this point. So, but if the uh, councillor nods, absolutely works for me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, two thumbs up. Um, any other questions? Okay, so this will this will come forward then at our December twentieth meeting uh, as a recommendation. Okay. Uh, thank you. Moving on, uh, 1.2 public notices bylaw amendment. Uh, again, Heather. Sure. So this is our legal. Uh, you'll see on the agenda often, uh, you know, public notices bylaw. So those are the legal requirements where we must provide public notice. Uh, there is the discretion uh, of the clerk also to provide further public notice on items that are of interest to the public that we feel that you know we should probably give public notice about that. And there's also all of our other advertising and things that go outside of the public notice. This bylaw deals specifically with the legal requirements in the different pieces of legislation where we must give public notice on the official council agendas. So the, as you can see, the last time we did a revision was 2007. There's been a few pieces of legislation that, legislation that have changed since then. So this uh, bylaw is before you now to adopt and ensure we are current with the existing legislation requirements. Uh, any, thank you. Any questions to council? Okay. Thank you. Uh, moving on the agenda, item 1.3, uh, conventional transit contract extension. Uh, well, that's you again, Heather. Yeah. Thank you, Mayor Poirier. So the conventional transit system, again, is a long-standing service that the city has provided uh, since 1934. Um, and the current conventional busing model has um, been in operation for a very long time. It is a city bus, city-owned bus, but it is contracted out to a, a service provider for the operation. So the, the city does not operate the bus. Uh, but the city has owned the bus. The current contract with First Student Tra uh, Transit Canada does expire December 31st, 2022. Um, and under this agreement, we either need to extend the agreement or the operation would cease as of December 31st unless there was a month to month arrangement. Um, we have been reviewing our transit ridership for quite some time. So it is a budget item. It's a, it's a heavily sub subsidized item um, and it, it is required review. So city staff have done um, a lot of work with the transit schedules. We've, done, we've invested, council's invested in um, you know, new shelters. We've invested in further advertisement, publications, uh, changing routes multiple times and ridership continues to decline. So we had, there was some funding opportunity that came available for a micro transit feasibility study. We applied for that funding, we were successful. Uh, the intent now is to work with a contractor, um, a consultant to do a review and provide council with a recommendation on what the best uh, route is moving forward for our conventional transit. So in the meantime, while that study and review is being conducted, we need to um, decide whether we want to continue with the conventional, conventional transit operation. And if so, the contractor is asked for a one-year extension to continue operation. So they need to know what the requirements are for them moving forward rather than a month-to-month -month type of um, operation. Staffing is very, very challenging. Uh, you will see on a regular basis where you know, bus routes are canceled, and that is always driven by, 99% uh, of the time, driven by staff shortages. So everyone is facing the same thing. Um, bus driving is a specialized license. It is specialized training. You can't just put somebody that is doing another type of business, the mechanic can't go and drive the bus. So there are often staff shortages which impact service levels. Um, Again, that will all be part of the review when we go through this micro transit review. So this report is covering simply the extension to the contract that currently exists to continue operation for one more year. Thank you, Heather. Any questions of council? Uh, council Thank you, Your So just to clarify, the budget of revenue for 2022 was 2000 and we may, in the current revenues are 48,000, and they are looking at a 6.5% operating cost and increase. Do we have a breakdown of what those operating 
costs are going toward? Well, I can tell you how much the you know the contract agreement is. So the budget, the hit to the budget is about three hundred fifty thousand mm -hmm. dollars. So you can take the revenues uh, mm -hmm. and the rest of it goes to the contract. There are some internal charges there. Um, our mechanics do support them to a certain extent. They don't maintenance the vehicle. That is for the buses. That is part of the contract with uh, first student. But there is a bit of support that is allocated um, for mechanics wages. And then there's some internal. Um, so we roll all, the, all of their coin. So that staffing support is allocated to that budget. Uh, we do the printing of the uh, <coughs> transit brochures. So that is allocated to that budget. So. The actual operation contract is about 319 and the rest of us, the rest of that balance of that operating budget is coming from staff. It is a costly um, service. Yeah. Uh, council, council. And they haven't asked for an increase. 6.5% yeah. for 2023, yes, for the one year extension. So that'll come forth again as a recommendation uh, to the December 20th meeting. Um, so moving on the agenda, so I just want to remind council that the, the next two items, um, just be careful in the questions you ask in open session. Uh, they, uh, there will be a fulsome discussion in camera. Uh, well, I'm just reminding everybody in that because we want to be asking questions that should uh, be appropriate in camera if it relates to individuals uh, and you know the four or five different uh, uh, sections there so um, just think about the questions you want to ask in the public and uh, there'll be an opportunity in the closed session later on in the day to ask uh, more specific questions so thank you um, so moving on to item 4.1, City QP Joint Gender Neutral Job Evaluation. So I'll hand it over to our HR Director. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Uh, the purpose of this report is really an information report. Um, as part of uh, our uh, partnership with QP Local, five, or local 191, uh, we have entered into a, a Joint Gender Neutral Job Evaluation. And this is a shared commitment uh, to continue uh, to maintain pay equity uh, across our organization for QB membership. Um, the Pay Equity uh, Act is legislation. It was enacted in 1987. And the purpose of that act is really to uh, redress systematic sex-based wage discrimination in Ontario workplaces. Uh, this act applies to all public sector and private and all private sector employees with more than employers with more than 10 employees. Um, and it really requires assessment of all, all jobs uh, to ensure that there's unbiased comparison and that wages are equal for equal work. Um, this is not the first time the city of Kenora has, uh, and, and QP191 have uh, engaged in this process in 2011. A uh, very extensive job evaluation was done and pay equity was achieved. Uh, the parties have renewed our terms of uh, reference uh, that will guide and support the process and a joint job evaluation committee has been established and that joint job evaluation uh, committee consists of three um, city representatives and three union representatives so together uh, we don't sit on opposing sides we sit together to manage the process and work through uh, it's important to note that job evaluation is not about adjusting wages Job evaluation is really about rating the context and the job. Um, it's not the performance of the incumbents. It's not based on what the incumbent brings to the job. It's really the job itself. Um, those jobs are rated against each other and really uh, form a hierarchy in terms of our existing wage structure. So there are um, a mandate, there's a mandate for the committee, uh, which is established in the QB uh, Gender Neutral Job Evaluation Plan. Uh, which I will say we are using uh, the QP plan. This is a nationally recognized best practice. So, uh, you know, there's no need for us to adjust or to do anything different. It is a well-established program. Uh, that mandate really ensures that we evaluate all jobs against the same criteria, which, are, which ensures uh, gender neutrality, that we um, maintain the integrity of the program in terms of being able to uh, engage in Questionnaires, so all employees out there that are a part of QB membership will receive an opportunity to participate. It's good engagement for them to talk about their work. 
and to explore any changes uh, to the jobs that have, may have happened. Um, through that, we do uh, we then take the information back, and our leaders of those positions take a look and review, and either um, uh, support or add to it, uh, or make adjustments as necessary. And then from there, it's called sore thumbing. We kind of take a look at all of the positions that have come back in, and make sure uh, if we see any anomalies that we have some engaged conversation. The joint job evaluation process and timeline is included in the report. Uh, joint communication right now is just being worked on. That will be issued shortly to uh, our, our QP uh, membership. Uh, we anticipate that the complete review happens June of uh, 2023. Uh, just a reminder, we will be heading into bargaining in December of 2023, so it's a really important process to ensure that we have a good understanding. Um, while there's no budgetary impacts um, uh, expected, uh, it is, or pay equity issues expected, there could be if we identify that we have fallen, um, we've slipped in a couple of areas, we would be legally required to address those. Um, so any uh, budgetary impacts stemming from those types of identifications would be um, immaterial in terms of a larger scope. Uh, would really be about slight adjustment to uh, those types of classifications. Although that's a low risk, it, it does, there could be an impact. Uh, we do have a moderate uh, to st strategic risk around, um, you know, this type of work. Uh, we want to make sure that uh, we are compliant with legislation. We want to make sure that uh, our employees are engaged in providing this process. Um, and we understand that as we start to head into bargaining, that this information will be considered at the table. Uh, I think that's pretty much everything for that report. Um, any questions of Council of Roberta? Oh, Council of Roberta? Thank you, Your Worship. Just to clarify, the, I understand that this is just reviewing the jobs specifically. This will not address that the pay equity adjustments that were done in 2011 haven't really been a, um, adjusted since then, correct? Pay equity Separate. was achieved. Yeah. And so all of the adjustments were made at that point in, in time. Mm -hmm. Because we we have no uh, we have not entered in throughout the life of bargaining into classification adjustment. Um, that's why I was saying, you know, the likelihood of pay equity slipping is fairly low because a consistent uh, percentage has been applied. Uh, the one thing that might <coughs> change is if job duties have significantly changed. So that's why, you know, we always caution that there could be yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. Thank you. Can I call, just follow up to that? Because I was reading the Harvard Business Review on how to identify and fix pay equity. So this is just a direct quote from them. And that pay, pay gaps start to reemerge as organizations experience employee turnover, um, reorganization changes in job duties, and subjective biases. So it's best practice to conduct spot checks annually with a deep dive every few years. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, any other questions of council? Uh, Roberta, uh, before you go on to your next item though, uh, we're going to cycle back to deputations because there was a misunderstanding. There was another individual who wanted to speak on one of the topics. So sorry about that, Michael. Uh, if you want to... Um, Go to the podium, and uh, um, you have 15 minutes. So okay, I won't take that long. <laughs> okay. I, hi, my name is Michael Barkley. Uh, I'm also a resident of Old Chalet Lane. I live right beside my brother Dean. Uh, I live at 501 Old Chalet Lane. Uh, I've been there for just over 10 years, and in that time, we've always been very fond of the park. And and no way do we ever wanted to uh, do anything that would stop the business or any uh, endeavor that the park. Uh, people are trying to make any, any current business or anything like that. Um, I've always been there with uh, previous uh, operators of the park, uh, whether it be Scott Green or the people before that. We walk through that park uh, almost every single day. There's a member of my family and Dean's family that go through that park every day. We love it dearly. Um, I can say a living on Old Chalet Lane, there is people that walk through that park every single day, like numerous, numerous peoples. Our people and it's a great way to walk it's just a it's a nice tra a trail I understand it's also part of the Kenora urban trail system uh, which is there uh, for not just foot traffic it's there for skidoo traffic ATVs everything it's about accessibility 
Um, in the last few years, um, I, I don't, I'm not here to bash Susan or Dave Lange. Um, I think they did a great job in keeping things quiet and in order there. But there has been definitely efforts made to stop even foot traffic from going through that park on that trail system. They're not going everywhere. They are going through there, past the bathrooms, towards the road, and back towards McKenna Way entrance. Um, they've had the blockades completely blocked so that people couldn't even walk through there. There was efforts made so that it was just wide enough to walk through there. Um, I've had to make phone calls and to get it widened. Um, one of the neighbors right now uh, takes his ATV, his own fuel, his own time. He has to try and like snow plow a walkway through there to make it safe for people to even walk. We live on a road that I'm like one of the youngest person people there that live on that road. They all go through there. Last winter, it was awful. There was so much snow. It was difficult everywhere. Um, but there was no attempts by the operators to make that walkway accessible. It is not safe. Previous to them operating, the city of Kenora, when those barricades were open, made it wide enough for cars, pedestrians. We do live in a town where the sidewalks are right beside the road. So cars and pedestrians can work harmoniously between each other. Um, to my knowledge, there's no complaints to the police in regards to people speeding through there. And I've been a member of the OPP for 26 years. Uh, I've been in Kenora for 20 years of that. And uh, it's very rare that I hear any complaints from the park. Susan has my number. We do communicate regularly, working together. If there is any issues, whether it be whether I'm on duty time or off duty, I'm always there to help them. Uh, I don't have those open communications between myself and Dave so much, but uh, um, we just don't see eye to eye on some issues, but that's uh, besides the point. My thoughts are that that road can be left open. The barricades can be open. It will create a safe corridor for people to walk. Uh, there's not a lot of traffic that goes through vehicles. In the three years that they've operated through the winter time when they've expressed their interest in operating and creating businesses for the winter activities, there has been nothing that has done anything on that side of that park. The only thing that we see is the Crocono, which is over by, I think it's Crocono, over beside the building. He keeps that parking lot clear and the side parking lot close to there so people can park. And even with that, there has been very, very little activity in regards to that. Um, so where we're proposing that those barricades stay open during the winter months, um, they used to be open and it was good. If they're looking for tourism, it also helps them to provide visibility. Um, it's just like Kenora. If we blocked off the road coming into Kenora, how much tourism we're going to see? If they have people going through there, they might see extra activities and it might create extra business for them. If you Google Maps, Anishinaabe Park and you're coming in from the west side, which is I would assume the majority of our tourism is coming from that side It takes you right down old chalet lane. I see people down there every year all summer all winter whether it be skidoos or the trucks and trailers with skidoos on or campers trying to turn around um, It's funny because I'm always out there and I always have to help them back down the road with their long trailers and back them around and turn them around um, We're just asking for the barricades to be open so there can be a safe passage for not just vehicles, but more so pedestrians the skidoos, um, the skidoo club here, they need that access as well to get their machines down there because they can't go by the Coast Guard. Right now they have to go back up 4th Avenue South and make a long tour around to get back to safe ice to be able to continue on with their trails. Um, so there's several safety aspects but it's just accessibility and, and it might create extra tourism for them. So, that's it. Thanks. Uh, any questions? Uh, a bit of a question, comment. So, I regret not seeing this uh, previously when this, this came up. I should have. But I did uh, receive contact from a couple of residents on Lakeside Crescent who had said that they accessed the snowmobile trail, the Sunset Country. Uh, yep. Snowmobile from the east end of the park and the only way for them to do that without trailering is to go down Old Shelley and yep. on their machines to get to the trail system which then gets them anywhere they want to go. Yep. So um, I think keeping some sort of access to those people is particularly important as well. It is. So last year what happened was the neighbor was plowing a road. He just uses a quad. Uh, with the given amount of snow we had last year, 
he could only do it as wide as a snow, like an ATV plow. What was happening is, as people were walking, and there was no effort by the park operators to keep that trail clear, the, it got narrow like the roads did, and when somebody came by with a skidoo, the skidoo couldn't get up on the bank. The people that were walking had to. Um, my neighbor was like... That's not ideal. It is not. It was not safe. Um, and when the roads open, I, I also contribute. Like we have a plow truck, a personal one. Um, we also help to keep it clean, keep it safe. Um, there's areas where I make extra curves in there so the cars can get by. They have visible, it's more visible going up the hill into Old Chalet Lane. Without that, the people just can't walk. Like last year, they couldn't at all. And people started going other places or just not walking at all. I know my neighbors, they couldn't walk it at all. Um, so it's important to keep those lanes open and people can walk and drive beside each other. And if they have any concerns about dangerous drivers or anything like that, I've worked with Susan, Susan on these issues. I was there for when she got hit with the ATV. Um, there was a resident that got charged this summer for driving inappropriate in the park on an ATV. So there is avenues that we can and help with to keep that concern for her down. Uh, Councillor Byrne. Thanks, Mike. Uh, just a quick question. Um, as, a, as a first responder, um, would you find it advantageous to have that, that laneway open? Just for example, if you were at the Canaway, say you were at the golf course and you got a 911 call on Old Chalet Lane, Lane, would that be advantageous to be able to go that way rather than go all the way around it? Yeah, at any time, like accessibility is number one, right? Yeah. If you can keep a laneway open, it's going to provide an advantage to first responders or anybody. Yeah. Whether it be a private citizen, that is the fastest way to get to most places cutting through the park there. Yeah. And because you're going to get the McKenna Way and then the 17 corridor through town, which is probably the quickest way. Um, people coming in from the east end of Kenora, if they're trying to, if they Google Old Chalet, they're gonna, it's going to take them through the park. Come from the west side, it's going to take them through the park. It's all about accessibility, providing people the way to walk, whether it be in skidoos, ATVs, and everything. Um, but they have made efforts to completely block that access. I guess my question is, if there's a medical emergency, a fire, a break and enter, something like that, yep. seconds, seconds, minutes are precious. Yep. So, so it would all help to all that. Yeah, thanks. Any other questions? Uh, thank you very much, Michael. And sorry thank about you. that. No, uh, thank you for the opportunity to come back up here and talk. Yeah. I appreciate that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Have a nice day. Okay, uh, moving on the agenda, uh, five or one point five. Uh, Roberta, I'll hand that back to you. Okay, thank you, Mayor Council. Uh, so the purpose of this report uh, is to discuss the twenty twenty three economic adjustment to the professional and managerial pay grid. Um, just so that you are aware, this is an annual uh, type of a report or decision that will be made by council. Uh, it is in accordance with HR-3-1 salary administration policy. Uh, the process uh, that we have for the professional managerial, which is our non-union group, um, is, is of course different because there is no bargaining uh, agent to uh, approve or to negotiate wages with. Um, coming January 1, uh, all of our collective agreements are in flight, so we're in the middle of collective agreements uh, that are ongoing. Our bargaining age, our bargaining groups, uh, QP, IBW, KPFFA, will all receive uh, their negotiated wage increases, and that's why we're here today. Is because you are the sole uh, approver of uh, the professional and managerial pay grid. Uh, so economic adjustments are important for a couple of reasons. Uh, most uh, often people think about recruitment, attraction, and retention. Uh, what's I think really important right now is our self-employment uh, self industry, as well as internal relativity is one of those ones that are really driving uh, in, in cases where uh, wages uh, are being discussed. Uh, you know, when we take a look at this, this group, this is a professional group. Um, that has uh, professional experience that is sought after. So that's the importance of this group. Um, in terms of the 2023 uh, wages, uh, we've included here uh, the increases for our uh, union groups, which QB will receive 1.5, IPW 1.5, KPFFA 1, and then our QB library group 1.5. 
Um, what's important for council to consider when they are uh, having discussion around the wage increases is really about the ability for the municipality to pay based on approved budget guidelines, our wage and benefits that were provided to our union groups, and the effective date of any uh, economic adjustment. What's also very important to note um, is that our owners' pensions, pensioners, will also receive a 6% increase in terms of their rates of pay. So that means, um, you know, when you're, you're talking about our uh, workforce, especially in this group, uh, anyone who is able to retire, um, the ability to receive a higher rate when you retire on your severance than what, what it is actually uh, at work is also causing a little bit of imbalance here this year. Uh, so the following options are available for council to consider. Uh, you can consider uh, any of these options. Uh, a 1.5 increase, which would be similar to what our bargaining group of QP, the largest group, 1.37 is really around a, a, an average of the, the four groups. Uh, an economic adjustment of a level determined by council or no economic adjustment at all. Uh, the budget impacts of this will go into whatever the decision is will be applied to the 2023 operating budget. Uh, just to give some reference, a 1.5 increase is about $75,000 as a whole for this whole group. Um, and, and that works out to be roughly just a little under $1,000 um, per person. Uh, inflation does present a high risk uh, this year. Uh, it's unclear uh, as to whether or not these high rates of inflation will become the new norm um, or merely just a short-term market pressure, uh, but those types of things are really impacting the compensation, which is you know, evident in the owner's uh, decision in terms of pensioners. Uh, so that is uh, the economic adjustment. I'm open to answer any questions. Any questions of Council? Uh, Councilor Madsen? Is there still a a grid system in place for management as well as this? Yes, so when we talk about economic adjustment, uh, we're talking about that percentage being applied to the grid. So it's applied um, across all of the salary bands uh, and it ensures that that band uh, grows and moves in accordance with the rest of the uh, labor groups. And how many of management is at the end of the grids? Uh, that I, I have to get that exact number for you. Yeah. Uh, any other questions? No. Uh, thanks, Roberta. And just to remind everybody on that this discussion, we'll, uh, looking for some direction, uh, and that will come up in camera later on in the day. Okay. Uh, okay. Thank you, Roberta. Uh, moving on. Uh, 3.1 Coker Road closure update. Uh, Marco, are you going to take this? Up? Yep. Uh, good morning, Mayor and Council. Just, uh, here to provide you an update and the status update, I guess, of the Coker Road. Um, so, delve into a little bit of history, I guess. Uh, going back to the May June floods in 2022 here. So, back at that time, uh, during those flood event or that specific flood event, there was about 370 meters length of road that was uh, inundated with water anywhere from about a foot and a half to two feet of water that submerged the road back in that time period with the high waters uh, being experienced on Black Sturgeon Lake. So when the uh, flood water started to recede in June uh, there was it was noticed that there were several uh, there were several incidents of deterioration on the road that was noticed like potholes and, you know surface granular uh, degradation and, and surface deformations on the road that was limited to the surface characteristics of the road at the time when it was inspected so when the uh, flood water started to stabilize in june uh, the eoc committee uh, brought forth a report to council at that time uh, and one of the options that was presented to council then was uh, to either fix the road in terms of putting it back to its original state, just regraveling the road and, and bring it back to its normal state, or as a second option to actually raise the road at the time to try and, and uh, alleviate any future potential flood conditions that may happen. So on June 10th, uh, a special meeting of council was uh, summoned and it was uh, decided upon that uh, the grade raise option was the option that the council of the day wanted to proceed on. Um, 
the engineering and infrastructure staff uh, secured a contractor so that work was uh, that consisted of reinforcing the road with various types of geofabric and geogrid reinforcing materials uh, in addition to replacing some culverts and the addition of gravel to build up the surface of the road to, uh, to the flood levels that were experienced earlier in the spring was conducted and uh, completed at around the end of June. Um, so the, the uh, work that was done in June was thought to have been a, a solution to future flooding uh, based on the known history of the road at that time. So, so for several decades during uh, you know, Jeffrey Malik and, and into amalgamation here, there was very little uh, detriment or, or poor uh, conditions of the road at that time at this specific location where the flooding occurred. So there was no known previous history of significant settlements uh, on that road. So as time progressed, we were uh, in a position to monitor that uh, specific location in terms of having, uh, we were looking at fall and spring uh, surveys of the road to make sure that the road was in a stable condition and that if there was any uh, future detriment, detriment to the road or at least confirming that the road was in a stable condition where it was going to occur and, and be stable for the for the future. So on October 28th was our first set of, uh, of surveys on the road which proved to have very little uh, minimal settlements that were uh, to be expected for a gravel road and such. Uh, five days later on November 7th, or 2nd the uh, road is getting some maintenance from the local or the city roads crews and there was some noticeable uh, dip into the road which was brought forth to the uh, the roads department and engineering and then on the next day on November 3rd is when um, the, uh, the, the large failure occurred where the road uh, slipped down almost about a three feet or about a meter on one side of the road in a localized area of that repair and grade graze which we feel is about 25 percent of the area that was uh, originally rehabilitated and brought up uh, for flood purposes back in June. So with that being uh, said, we can see in the report here some of the photos and what the, the road looked like you know, shortly after the, the June grade raise and what the road looked like uh, on the left hand side picture there uh, after the failure in November. Subsequently the road got closed uh, uh, due to the concerns of safety to the traveling public. Uh, we weren't quite sure if this was uh, going to be just a one-time event or uh, you know there was more to occur with subsidence and detriment to the road so during the period of uh, November 6th to the 10th we did um, or sorry from the 3rd to the 10th we did numerous uh, investigation not investigation but inspections of the road to uh, determine its state whether it was uh, either stabilizing or not or whether more detriment was going to occur so on November 6th, it was noticed that about at that point in time, it seemed like the road was uh, not <coughs> deteriorating any further. And we waited until about November 10th to, to give it a few more days to ensure that we had uh, some confidence that the road was no further, wasn't further failing and to see what options were available to the city to try and, and address the affected road. Um, so on November 14th it was decided to start rehabilitating the road so again we had uh, put in some geotextile fabrics and grids to, to further reinforce the road. Uh, we started putting gravel back onto the road to try and build it up to its, its original June uh, elevation uh, above the flood level. And over time, I guess, until approximately November 22nd, the rehabilitation period, we noticed that the road was still somewhat failing in some form or fashion in terms of localized settlements at that one area again. So it was decided with the, uh, with the uh, continuing uh, settlement and destabilization of the road 
that we, uh, on November 24th, we brought a, a drill rig in to poke into the ground and see where, uh, you know, depth to bedrock was, because that's usually the best type of condition you can have underneath the road is the bedrock for stability. So upon that drilling operation, we found that, uh, you know, bedrock was still, you know, almost 50 feet down uh, below the surface of the road. And with the, the ease of that drilling rig going through that material down to bedrock, it's, uh, it was determined that the underlying soils of the road base were quite uh, mucky and, and not really good materials for a road base to sit on especially with the, uh, the proximity of the bog and the adjoining uh, area of black sturgeon. So at that point in time, we ceased operations. We further uh, have kept the road closed with the uh, going forward. What we're looking at doing is bringing in a geotechnical engineer uh, and some expertise to actually do some proper boreholes in a specific area to determine what underlying conditions and soils there are and have that specific uh, uh, engineer who's trained in geotechnical engineering to give options or some solutions that may be viable, uh, you know, in terms of today's current engineering standards and construction methods. So we are looking to uh, try and bring that back to the table to council to uh, come back with some options for council to look at. There is uh, one possibility of uh, potentially opening up maybe one lane to traffic in the short term, but we will be basing that decision and, or that option to council based on the geotechnical investigation. Uh, you know, we don't want to uh, open up a half a road because the current failure area is, is uh, localized to one half of the road on, on one side of the road being the westbound lane. So in, in we've initiated discussions with the geotechnical engineer at this point and um, uh, in talks this, as early as this morning, it was identified that the geotechnical work potentially probably won't happen until January based on, on certain schedules for drillers and certain equipment to come in to, to perform that work and get the necessary boreholes and soil investigation that the engineers would need to, to look at. So it, it looks like it might be a little bit more time before we get the necessary feedback and results from the geotechnical engineering uh, portion that we're looking at uh, trying to do here in the near future to make a decision on that road. So at this point, it still remains closed, uh, you know, due to the safety of, of the public and making sure that we don't have uh, a, a situation where, uh, you know, vehicles or anybody using that road might come into peril or, or, or you know, danger, I guess. So. At this point in time, um, we would be looking to provide more information to Council uh, in the future when we can get some geotechnical engineering uh, you know, back on our laps here, some alternatives and whatnot and what options they may com come up with. Uh, even the short term solution of maybe opening up one lane later in the winter. Um, So that's, that's pretty much where we're at, and I guess, in terms of a quick kind of history to date on what we've done as of the floods and where we kind of stand today in terms of the condition of the road <coughs> and what, uh, you know, the city's looking at doing here in the near future to try and get some information back on that road to make some future decisions and options to council. Thanks, Marco. Uh, Councillor Moncrief and then Councillor Manson. Thanks, Your Worship. So in speaking to um, residents who've been out there for a long time, somewhere between October 28th and November 3rd, they're alleging that that's when the quarter I failed. Uh, do you think that's a fair statement? That period of time is roughly when, when, we, see, when we started to see destab destabilization of the road uh, between the 28th and November 3rd or 4th. And uh, that's the reason why the road was closed eventually there that, in that early period in November. It's unknown what, what was done in the past, whether there is corduroy underneath that road or not. Uh, obviously the drilling investigations with the geotechnical work would probably confirm that in one way or another, uh, if corduroy even exists underneath that road uh, or not. But over the, the uh, 
couple of periods of time. The old timers say that it's there. It's there, yeah. So, you know, with the amount of, of uh, mud and, and other poor materials underneath that road, it's hard to say if that corduroy uh, was put in at some point in the past, how deep it might have sunk into the mud and has lost its stability, especially with the flood waters and the amount of saturation it saw for that extended period uh, of those, you know, two, two and a half months. So it, it would probably be determined where that corduroy is, if there is any, uh, through the geotechnical investigations and the drilling, I'm sure they'll come up with some, uh, you know, wood product or, or wood or logs or whatnot that the corduroy uh, exists. And perhaps that might give us, you know, some idea of where that, the road currently sits in terms of its stability and if the corduroy is even still manageable or, or still working to some some right. extent. So of course safety is our concern and uh, just adding to that I think if there's any sort of um, numbers that you have about that road usage I know you do axle counts in various places I don't know how recent you've done that on that road but before a decision's made maybe we could have some idea of how many people are inconvenienced yeah, I don't, I don't, I wouldn't uh, commit to say that we have any specific vehicle counts uh, on that specific piece of road. Um, it, perhaps it's more of, a, of an analysis on who lives on the road and what directions they might drive, how close they are to that specific uh, location. Mm -hmm. I know there's been some uh, inquiries about, you know, school buses not being able to, to traverse the road and make the loop, which is inconvenient to some. Uh, you know, we've been in discussions with emergency services to make sure they're aware of which side they need to come in for any kind of given emergency, uh, either side of that that, uh, that area. So, it, it, I would say it would be a, an estimation on how many vehicles might use that section of road. Um, I, I would have to think in the summer, probably a little bit more with seasonal residents that live up on that end, would uh, you know be using that road system a little bit more than maybe uh, some of the locals that are there full time. Um, yeah, so I, I don't know if we can really come up with a number uh, of vehicles that use that road at this point in time without actually doing a vehicle count, which you can't do if the road is closed. Right, yeah. So we'd be kind of behind the eight ball, but something that maybe that could be looked at in the future, uh, if that kind of data is necessary. I know they were doing it on the bridge, say for example, but that doesn't really count because you don't know how you're going to do that. Yeah, but uh, on the, some of the sm some of the more localized roads, you know, the Coker and all the offshoots of it. Uh, yeah, it'd be more difficult to get those traffic counts for sure. You know, we we could do some uh, again, like I said, estimation based on the number of residents and and using kind of common knowledge and engineering practices out of engineering, you know, traffic books to say so many residents, so many vehicles per day, you know, based on an average and and a theoretical type of calculation. Uh, we have heard from one who's been affected uh, in a couple of capacities. One is the school bus and the, ch and the children or their children's pickup for school and also the access to their to their mailbox which was unfortunately on the other side uh, of the, the, the area so they're having to make the full loop back and forth each way through the, the southern loop. And we have uh, reached out to both um, Student First and the Post Office, you know, to see if there is some accommodation that could be made, but of course that's not up to us, but we have communicated the situation to those two organizations. Thank you. Uh, okay, uh, next councillor. Yeah, some of my questions was how many residents is it affecting and what feedback, can you kind of answer that? My other question is, what communication have we done to the people on that road? Have we done individual communication or has it been abroad? Uh, it's been abroad. There's there's no individuals living in the affected area between where the failure is occurring. So they're either on one side or the other. Okay. Uh, Councillor Bernie and then Councillor Chief. Just high level there, Marco. I don't expect you to get into details, but uh, options to fix it. Yeah, and that's what we're really waiting for that, that information to come back from the geotechnical engineer. Um, you know, I, I suppose if, if the, uh, the poor material underneath that section of road would have been much less in terms of its depth, we could have probably looked at more in-house, maybe conventional type of, of, uh, of repairs to it. 
Um, so really looking at, at the information and, and the options provided from a geotechnical engineer based on, like Councillor Moncrie said, is there corridor underneath there? Is it serving any purpose? Uh, you know, what types of materials are underneath there? Um, so we're really, you know, looking for uh, information uh, from that geotechnical investigation to guide our, our you know, I guess our decision making going forward. The other thing that uh, you know we will look at in house here is potentially or the potential of, of maybe relocating the road or realigning the road perhaps off of this specific area of concern. Um, so that's probably one of the options we'll, we'll investigate internally to, to see. Um, right now north of that road uh, we're in a favorable position I'd say because that land is owned by the Crown. So there might be some opportunity to gain some lands from the Crown to maybe real, realign that road uh, in, in a more adequate uh, area and off the bog and away from you know the potential floodwaters that it would address, but also the, the you know the current poor materials <coughs> underneath that road. So that's one option we, we have considered or have in the back of our minds going forward. Also, okay, thanks, um, Councillor. Thank Chase. you, Your Worship, um, Mark. I apologize for missing the beginning of your presentation. So I, I, again, if this was already discussed. Uh, my apologies. Um, given that we're heading into winter season, things are freezing up. I mean, is there enough stability in that bog in terms of ice conditions to create a temporary access or have some type of uh, a route that goes through there now that things are freezing up? I wouldn't say a temporary, but that's one of the options we are looking at potentially to open up one lane, at least for the small volume of traffic that we feel would, would be going down that road might, might accommodate one lane of traffic where you know, signs would be put up to say yield to oncoming traffic and they would share one lane, you know, similar to a situation like in Q8 where we share the bridge going across yeah. Portage there, Portage Bay. So that is one option we want to look at. Uh, but again, I don't think we want to investigate that option until we get some information back from the geotechnical drilling. Um, obviously, I think that drilling would give us some idea of how, st uh, how stable the road surface would be in terms of the frost into it and whatnot. So that is one thing we are considering, but I think until we feel comfortable to get that information back from the core drilling back, that I think we stay a status quo for health and safety purposes for, for people using that road. So that is one option we are looking at to potentially try and, and open up one lane uh, later this winter after we get some confirmation back from the geotechnical investigation. Okay, thank you. Yeah, uh, Councillor. It's Monster. just more of a comment. I, in looking at your map now, I'm sorry I didn't realize earlier, but I think that's where the snowmobile trail goes off. And if you start interrupting pierogi night at the Red Sea, <laughs> <laughs> you're going to hear a lot more about this because that's a thing. That's a thing. <laughs> well, snowmobiles should be able to tra traverse the road. I'm, I'm assuming. Uh, they don't go down the road, but across the they road. They cross it right there. That's the trail, I think. So they, <coughs> I, I guess they would have to try and figure just something so out know. there. Just so so you know. <laughs> the the area in question, I, I don't think that would be the exact location, because right where the failure area is, there's a little rock cut. So I, I'm, I think they would have to be probably yes. one side or the other, east or west of that specific failed area. But perhaps that's something we'll have that's to touch, touch base with maybe the Sunset Trail Riders or I'm not sure if that's a sanctioned trail or if that's just a... Oh gosh, that conversation? I'm not getting into yeah, that okay. conversation right now. I think it is a trail, a groom trail. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, perhaps we should maybe touch base and just yeah, confirm that's that. Yeah, good idea. Then. Okay, thank you. A any other questions of council? So, um, thanks, Marco. Uh, sooner the better. Um, I know myself and that I've had, I don't know, I, I've stopped counting now the calls I've had about, uh, and not that they're upset or whatever, but there, it is more, and I think you kind of alluded to that about the timeline. Um, they were just one, you know, is this thing, you know, I think they've come to the realization it could be longer than they anticipated um, to, to get that information and, and you know, do remediation and that. Like, uh, yeah. I mean, it's going to have to be done right, whatever happens. Uh, but there's also going to be a cost to fix it, and so we have to be, um, you know, we're going to have to take all that into consideration when we're making decisions. So, thank you very much. Yeah, and I think it's it's a it's a similar type of situation uh, and process that we ran into Pinecone, yeah. right? So it took several months to try and 
and uh, you know find the root cause of the problem, what the solutions were, and then finally get the work done. So, but uh, that wasn't closed though. That's the difference. Yes, um, we were fortunate enough there that it was it was more of an embankment on the shoulder as opposed to the the full width of the road or a majority of the width of the road in this specific location. So. Uh, we were able to you know keep one lane of traffic open for Pinecone, um, you know during that period of time. So it is a bit of a different situation that way, but you know the steps and the and the length of time are going to be very similar. I just okay. want to I just want to re reiterate we we went to every length that we could with our in-house techniques to try and address this issue. You know, so um, we recognize it's inconvenient. We we really have exhausted our internal options at this point. And just uh, just before we move on, and I, I mean, communication is the, like however we can communicate this out and continue to communicate it uh, as we move through this process uh, is vitally important. Um, I think we've made that commitment as a new council to ensure that that occurs. So we would hope that that would follow suit. And I'm not suggesting that methods from before didn't work in that, but we just have to ensure that we're communicating this out uh, in an orderly fashion. So, thank you. Okay, uh, moving on uh, to some good news, I guess. Uh, 4.1 application to the Ontario Trillium Fund uh, in Stace. You're yeah, going to take this thank one? Thank you very much. Uh, Council, the report uh, before you was related to a recommendation and authorized administration to submit an application to the Ontario Trillium Fund under its Resilient Communities Fund for the MUSE. Um, this is a funding envelope that has uh, just come out. It's the first time that municipalities can uh, apply for it and it's uh, directly a result of COVID uh, and the funding is intended to support projects that are uh, uh, immediate or longer term in nature. Applicants can apply for up to $200,000 under this envelope and there is no requirement for the municipality to have any matching dollars, which is uh, quite unusual. Uh, projects should demonstrate uh, that they're developing new approaches, that they're starting new activities, adjusting strategies, or planning for future challenges. Um, the reason that this project is required and this funding is required is that when the Daily Miner News uh, shut down, they gave all of their old material uh, to the Muse. So they've got boxes and rings of all of this information and the purpose of the project is to get monies to digitize all of that. So uh, the total ask of Trillium would be $110,000. We would be purchasing some hardware which includes a scanner for larger uh, books, hard drives to store the data and then also some labor to support the effort. Um, from a MUSE's perspective, it's kind of a cool opportunity because sometimes when research is being done, uh, it, uh, it generates revenue. So this could be a new revenue opportunity for the MUSE as well. So from that perspective, it's pretty cool. So the funding, uh, or the budget, again, no uh, financial impact to the municipality. And from a risk perspective, the, the risk is really based on not applying for the funding. I'm happy to answer any questions. Any questions of council? Okay, uh, thanks, Stacey. Yeah. Uh, so moving on to item 5.1, application to Fednor Investment Attraction Project. And Stace, I guess you're on again. Yep, thank you very much. Uh, so uh, this report is related to uh, this specific application to Fednor. Um, the ask of Fednor would be $270,000. Part of this uh, recommendation would be that council confirms its commitment to the project. So it's 10% or $30,000. And we would fund this through uh, VAT tax uh, revenue. And uh, one thing that you'll see with most applications is a line uh, that says that council hereby approves any cost overruns associated with this project. This is very true for about 95% of the applications that you'll see, just so you know. Um, uh, clearly COVID had a major impact on the city of Kenora's uh, new development that was to take place and, and basically everything stood still uh, for a couple of years. Um, you know, moving forward, the city of Kenora will focus on a strategy to accelerate investment attraction, economic growth, and recovery. Um, uh, there's two guiding documents that really support this project. One is the Strat Plan. The other one is the five-year economic development and tourism strategy. Uh, in terms of the project itself, there's two phases to it. Uh, phase one is going to be uh, a lot of data analysis. Uh, <coughs> 
analysis of the city itself and just uh, sector reviews, uh, uh, trying to target specific industries that might be uh, a good fit for Kenora. And then the second part is what I'll call the build phase. Uh, so that's taking all of that data and all that information and building it into something that I'll say is camera ready so that as developers come to us, we can cobble together bits of information that might be important to them. Uh, key deliverables are going to be a labor market. Uh, uh, research is going to be done. Sector analysis and review for industries that would uh, want to target uh, to locate Kenora. Analysis of the city of Kenora itself, things like schools, the airport, uh, major and minor employer support industries, uh, some housing data, and ultimately, uh, when developers are looking to uh, make a decision uh, at a, in a community that they might be interested in, uh, they need information. They're going to be building their own feasibility studies. Um, other uh, municipalities are going to try to uh, attract them to their particular uh, municipality. So this is going to give us the ability to very quickly turn um, very high quality documents to these developers. Uh, in a way that is going to give them the information that they need to evaluate um, opportunity. The overall project is going to be $300,000, again $270,000 from FedNor and $30,000 from MAC. Um, from a risk perspective, there's always the risk if you don't apply for these things that you won't be able to do the project, but I think that um, having the ability to accelerate um, the relationship uh, with developers through proper information is very important. So I think that this will really give us a leg up as we look to stimulate things in the market. Uh, Councillor Chase, then Councillor. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, Stace, I recall when I was on the commission in maybe 2018 or 2019 that a very similar project was completed. At least it sounds very similar. Um, has this, is there a neat, like, is is the outcome of that project no longer relevant because things have changed so much because of COVID or what? It just feels like we're kind of duplicating that effort that was done not that long ago. So I'm just I, curious why. Uh, I'm not familiar with that uh, study, if you will, okay. or any sort of, uh, the last major sector profile review that was done was actually when Jennifer Finley was here. So if you look at the, a lot of the data that we have, it's old, okay? It's, it's not current. Um, it's not at the level it needs to be. If you go and uh, speak to developers, they talk about it, um, them wanting a playbook, basically, from the city of Kenora. So this allows us to sort of build that playbook. Thank you. Uh, well, sure. Uh, Councillor Randallingham, uh, Councillor Moncrief, and then Councillor Patrick. And anybody else. <laughs> That's um, the order. <laughs> Being a part of this is that we hereby approve any cost over associated with the project. Does that come out of the MAT tax as well? Any overruns? Should there be any? Um, typically what would happen is if we do not have budget, we would come back to council with a budget amendment. And uh, when we do that, we would suggest make recommendations in terms of how we would pay for that at that time. Okay. Uh, I. Uh, when, when I look at $300,000 for this p uh, particular project and conversations that we would have had with consultants in preparation to do this application, I feel that there's adequate budget there. Thank you. Yeah. And, and I just wanted to add, Councillor, the first time when I got here, I saw that. I was like, whoa, positive <laughs> So that's actually language that you're going to see on a regular basis with any of these funding applications. It's sort of one of the preconditions. So it sounds scarier than it is, but we do we do our best to hit that budget, and, and if we would need to go over, we would come back to council as well. Uh, Councillor Monk. Who's going to be doing this? Who's doing this? We would go to tender for this. So it's outside. That's right. So we would have, uh, and, and you know, there'd be a lot of engagement um, uh, through okay. this process. But yeah, we would go external. So you're contracting it. Yeah. And uh, my other question, just left. Can you remind was tourism is in the title, but. I don't really see any specific tourism mentioned in the um, tactic section. So I just wanted to sort of There's always a very tight link between economic development and tourism. So um, th this is really intended. Uh, I mean, we were go we will end up gleaning all sorts of information as a result of this that maybe we can apply to a tourism sort of play. But really, this is about development attraction. Uh, as you know, we haven't set our priorities yet as a group, and I'm wondering if what the timeline is for the FedMart application and 
good question. And amongst ourselves, we actually have a bet. <laughs> so, uh, phase one, we will, uh, we're hoping to hear in two to three weeks. And then uh, we're hoping that within 90 days after that. Uh, it really depends on their meeting schedule and that sort of thing. And, and like NOHFC, for example, uh, they, they, don't, uh, they don't let us know when those uh, meetings, board meetings are going to take place when they're evaluating these, um, these applications. So it kind of just floats in the, in the background there. So we don't really know clearly the timelines, but we can sort of suggest that it would be around the 90 to 120 So they have an older program and does applying for one prevent you from applying again for another year or is there any? It, it, it really depends on the particular funding envelope that uh, takes place. So um, the earlier application that you would have seen for the Muse, for example, uh, we didn't want to compete with that particular application. We have had a discussions with FedNor where there's a feeling that this is a good fit for them. So we kind of gave up the resiliency funding for the use, and we thought that this would be a good fit for FedNor. Okay, thanks. Yeah, uh, Councillor Clark. Thank you, Councillor Van Bellingham. Ask my question. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there you go. Um, okay, uh, seeing no other questions than that. Uh, thanks very much, Dave. Thank you. Uh, good luck. I, I know you uh, You have a very good, uh, and your staff have a uh, very good record of accomplishments in these areas, so um, in his own best. Thank you. Um, so moving on the agenda, um, so under other, uh, next meeting, so subject to confirmation of the December 20th uh, council meeting, uh, our next meeting will be on a Wednesday. Uh, January 11, 2023, for Committee of the Whole. So, um, again, just keep bearing that in mind. Um, so, we have a motion uh, to adjourn to close meeting. <coughs> Resolution number two, marked by myself and seconded by Councillor Bernie, that this meeting now be adjourned to close session at 11.05 a.m. and further that pursuant to Section 239 of the Municipal Act 2001 as amended authorization is hereby given for committee to move into a closed session to discuss items pertaining to the following. Labor relations, two matters, salary review and vacancy. Disposition of land, one matter, application to purchase municipal property. New personal matter about an identifiable individual, two matters, Northwestern Health Unit uh, and accessory advisory committee appointments. A trade secret, scientific, technical, commercial, financial, or labor relations information supplied in confidence to the municipality or local board, which if disclosed can reasonably be expected <coughs> to prejudice significantly the competitive position or interfere significantly with contractual or other negotiations of a person, group of persons, or organization, or matter policing coalition. Thank you. <laughs> uh, any discussion? All those in favor? <laughs> Carried.
Paul's meeting to order, please. Uh, it's noon. Um, so I would like to call on uh, Councillor uh, Bernie to do a land acknowledgement, please. Thank you. As we gather, we recognize that we are on Treaty 3 lands, which are steeped in rich Indigenous history and home to many First Nations and Métis people today. We continue to be thankful for the partnerships with Indigenous people. We give thanks for the many blessings we enjoy in the city of Kenora. We seek wisdom in our minds, clearness in our thinking, truth in our speaking, and always love in our hearts, so that we may try always to unite the citizens of Kenora. Let these principles guide us in our decision making. Thank you. Uh, so moving on the agenda, uh, ca uh, Council Declaration of Pecuniary Interest and the gener General Nature Thereof. So on uh, today's agenda from a previous meeting, or from a meeting at which a member was not in attendance, uh, I see none. Um, item number one, applications being considered. So the Zoning Bylaw Amendment D14-22-07, uh, Civic Address, Unaddressed Property, Nelson Street, uh, Registered Owner, Area Developments, Kenora Inc., Agent Not Applicable. Uh, I will call on the uh, applicant uh, for their presentation for the planning application. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize I was making a presentation. <laughs> well, you don't have to, but you, you're, you're provided an opportunity. So. Uh, we, we've, uh, we, we've asked for, uh, I'm Fred Wright. Uh, I'm Fred Wright. I'm one of the partners in Airy Development. Um, we have applied for uh, a change in zoning from R1 to R2. Uh, the property is uh, in a neighborhood. Uh, we believe uh, that our plans are uh, uh, compatible with the uh, neighborhood. Uh, we've actually had positive comments from uh, some of the neighbors, which is a pleasant uh, change. <laughs> and. Uh, uh, we haven't uh, had any uh, negative uh, comments that we're aware of. So, uh, uh, yeah, okay. Kevin has a report for okay. you, I think. Yeah, thanks, Fred. Um, so moving on, uh, item number two, city planner report. So, Kevin, I'll leave that with you. Yes, uh, good afternoon, uh, Your Worship, Council. Uh, I'm happy to say that today's going to be probably one of the more simple reports you hear from me over the next four years. Um, <laughs> Uh, there will be, so I'm sure there will be many more entertaining ones. Um, what we have today here is uh, an application for zoning amendment, as Mr. Wright uh, has already stated, uh, to change the uh, zoning of a property on Nelson Street, uh, currently unaddressed, uh, from R1 residential first density zone to R2 residential second density zone. Uh, and the uh, purpose of that is uh, to amend the zoning to permit the development of a property of the property with a duplex dwelling which is not permitted under the current R1 zone. Uh, the, the subject property is currently cleared and vacant. It is a fully serviced lot with approximately 15 and a half meters of frontage on Nelson Street and an area of approximately 435 square meters. Uh, the applicant has indicated that the lot has always been vacant but the, the municipal records indicate that dwelling was located on the property previously uh, as recently as 1987, uh, there is no record of when that dwelling was removed. Uh, there's a photo of the property in the report from uh, sunnier days uh, when you could uh, see the site fairly well. Uh, I'm just going to review uh, legislative policy and city directives and the compliance of the proposed rezoning with that. Uh, we start with the Provincial Policy Statement uh, 2020, uh, which uh, all zoning amendments are, uh, have to be in compliance with or respect the general direction of. Uh, the, the Provincial Policy Statement, or PPS, uh, directs planning authorities to provide for an appropriate range and mix of housing options and densities to meet projected market-based and affordable housing needs of current and future residents. And this is to be achieved by various means, and I've highlighted uh, a couple that stand out. Uh, which be, being uh, directing the development of new housing towards locations where appropriate levels of infrastructure and public service <coughs> facilities are or will be available to support current projected needs and permitting and facilitating all housing options required to meet the social, health, economic and well-being requirements of current and future residents including special needs requirements and needs arising from demographic changes and employment <coughs> opportunities. 
Uh, the next document I'll refer to is the City of Kenora's Official Plan 2015. Uh, the land use designation of this property and surrounding properties is established <coughs> area. Residential development is encouraged as infilling and redevelopment of full municipal services. Medium density residential use is supported, provided that the development is in keeping with the character of the area. Uh, the development as proposed would qualify as medium density or 17 to 40 units per net, hec uh, per net hectare. Minor changes to land use that are compatible with existing land uses. <coughs> do not result in significant increases to traffic, dust, odor, or noise, and uh, are similar in scale to the surrounding built form and that improve the quality of life for area residents may be permitted through an amendment to the zoning bylaw. Uh, then finally, change, uh, in regards to the city's uh, zoning bylaw itself, uh, as I've noted previously, it's zoned R1, which allows for the development of single detached housing and other compatible uses serviced by municipal sewer and water. Uh, or with municipal water only. The R1 zone does not permit the development of a duplex and therefore the zoning amount. The proposed R2 zoning uh, allow, does allow for the development of single detached as well as semi-detached and semi-detached housing and uh, other compatible uses on municipal water and sewer, including a duplex. Minimum lot area and frontage requirements in the R2 zone are the same as those in the R1 zone, which is 400 square, 450 square meters of lot area and 15 meters of frontage. At 435 square meters, the lot is equally or approximately 3% undersized for both zones and therefore no minor variance is required. Uh, now we did complete a uh, interdepartmental and interagency circulation where we sent this uh, application out to uh, uh, relevant city departments. And, uh, and external agencies. Uh, the only two comments we received back uh, were from our land acquisition and development officer, uh, noting concerns about the uh, lot size, uh, that, uh, that it is undersized as an R2 lot, and uh, uh, by one means of calculating the density, it would come out to 45.9 units per, nectar, per net hectare. Uh, the established area, as I've already uh, noted, uh, sports 17 to 40 units per net hectare. Uh, and I'll come back to that in a, in a few minutes. Uh, and also uh, we received comments back from CP Rail. Uh, so they make reference to their uh, proximity guidelines that CP and CN came up with in 2013 and direct uh, attention to their website where they have those uh, detailed. There's a report that can be found at the link they noted. And they respectfully requested that the recommended guidelines be followed. And then they add a, added a sort of a specific comment here um, which is this is a bit of a unique one to me, uh, at least in recent history, where they've recommended that all property and tenancy agreements and offers of purchase and sale for all dwelling units in the proposed building contain the condition that a CPR uh, right of way and or yard is located adjacent to the subject land with operations conducted 24 hours a day, seven days a week, including the shunting of trains and the idling of locomotives. There may be alter alterations to or expansions of the railway facilities and or operations in the future, which alterations or expansions may affect the living environment of the residents in the vicinity, notwithstanding the inclusion of any noise and or vibration, attenuating measures in the design of the development and individual dwellings. The CPR will not be responsible for complaints or claims arising from the use of its facilities and or its operations on, over or under the aforesaid right of way and or yard. Now, and then finally, in regards to uh, public circulation and comments, uh, so notice of the application was given in <coughs> accordance with Section 34 of the Planning Act and circulated to persons and public bodies as legislated, so that includes all property owners within 120 metres of the subject property. Uh, the Planning Advisory Committee met on October 18th and had a hearing in their uh, recommendations, including the package for Council. Uh, as of the date of this report, uh, well, as of today's date, uh, we did receive one comment from a member of the public, uh, which we attached. Uh, the author expresses concern regarding losing their driveway access. So finally, turning to my evaluation, uh, the proposed zoning amendment, in my opinion, from R1 to R2 is appropriate to permit development of a duplex on the property. Uh, both the provincial policy statement and the official plan are supportive of infill development, which makes efficient use of existing infrastructure and which will provide dwelling units to meet the housing needs of the community. The official plan is supportive of, me of medium density development, which is defined as 17 to 40 units per net hectare. Uh, some discretion, uh, in my opinion, needs to be applied as to the interpretation of these limits. 
It is the practice of the city to approve two unit, dwelling, two unit dwellings on a properties that meet the minimum lot size requirement of 450 square meters in the R2 zone. A strict calculation of net density based on lot area provides a calculation of 1.8 units on a 450 square meter property, uh, being equivalent to 40 units on a one hectare property. At approximately 435 square meters, the same calculation works out to 1.74 units on this subject property, which is similar enough to support a full two unit duplex, uh, you know, just if you apply rounding, uh, which otherwise meets all applicable regulations in the R2 zone. Uh, the driveways of adjacent properties are entirely located on the municipal right-of-way and will not be obstructed by development of the subject property. And uh, just to add one extra note about the, the CPR comments, we, we, we do see a variety of uh, CPR comments. Uh, as you know, uh, a lot of properties in the city of Kenora are near uh, the CPR line, which runs right through the middle of our community. Uh, in this case, there's a pretty good sized ridge of rock between the subject property and the CPR lines, uh, which uh, CPR may not have been looking at topographic maps uh, when they uh, provide their comments. Uh, so I see personally no reason to be concerned about proximity to the CPR line yard, so it, but it's certainly good for the developer to know that the CPR has concerns that uh, you know, that doesn't hurt to bring those to the attention of anybody buying a property uh, nearby, the, near the uh, rail lines, uh, you do get used to that noise fairly quickly, but uh, uh, you know, it can be something that somebody's not prepared for. Uh, with that, uh, that concludes my report. Uh, my recommendation is that uh, Council approve the application for zoning bylaw amendment file number D14-22-07 to change the zoning of the subject property from R1 to R2 zone. And that concludes my report. Thank, thanks, Kevin. Um, so moving on the agenda, item number three, public comment. So I think we've heard one of the comments, or you provided a comment, which would have been from the public. Uh, but I see nobody in chambers today to uh, uh, discuss this. So uh, we'll move on to item number four, which is questions of council. Um, and bear in mind, um, it's just more for clarification, uh, either from um, our staff, the planner, or from the applicant, um, and the any decisions that we will make uh, in a subsequent meeting, which will be the 20th of December, it'll come forward as a recommendation. So, is there any uh, questions of any councillors? No? Okay, well, you were right. Uh, item number five. Uh, Close of the public meeting. This uh, meeting is to be declared closed following any comments and questions. And uh, does someone have a. No, nope, it's a, just you just closed. Yeah, so it's uh, at 12 12. Thank you.
Uh, so, uh, welcome back uh, into the uh, open session of our Committee of the Whole. Um, now, there's a, uh, there should be three recommendations. Um, there is, Your Worship. So, from the closed session, we have three uh, reports coming to the open session. One, the Northwestern Health Unit appointment. Two, the Accessibility Advisory Committee appointment. And three, the 2023 Economic Adjustment Professional Managerial Pay Grid. Uh, I will speak to the first two reports, which are my reports. The first one is the Northwestern Health Unit appointment. And um, Council has supported the appointment of uh, Rebecca Weinberg to the Board of Health for the Northwestern Health Unit for a term at the pleasure of Council no later than November 14, 2026. Second is the Accessibility Advisory Committee. There, uh, the Council has supported Chad English to the Accessibility Advisory Committee for a term at the pleasure of Council no later than November 14, 2026. And I will turn the 2023 Economic Adjustment over to Roberta. Thank you, uh, Mayor and Council. Uh, so for the report on 2023 economic adjustment, uh, the recommendation will read that Council hereby review and consider economic adjustment uh, to the professional and managerial grid uh, at the rate of 1.5% effective January 1, 2023 in accordance with HR-3-1 salary administration policy. Would you like to? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'll just declare a conflict on um, the first report out of the closed session, the appointment to Northwestern Health Unit to Board of Health, as it relates to my employment. Thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, so is there any discussion on those three items? <laughs> Going with the intuition. Okay. Well, uh, Thank you for today. I mean, it was our kind of our first official meeting. Um, and uh, see, we uh, <laughs> no, transacted, some business. Yeah, <laughs> transacted some business uh, uh, a lot uh, a lot quicker than I, I thought we would. I thought we'd be here till supper time. So um, anyhow, uh, thanks for everybody's participation. And if there's nothing else, I am going to adjourn this meeting.